The Preface of Northern Trails, Book Two. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa Jean. Northern Trails, Book Two, by William J. Long. Preface. The reader who follows these trails will find them leading into a new country, a land of space and silence where it is good to be, away up among the mountains and woods and salmon rivers and mossy barren grounds of Labrador and Newfoundland. There he will find himself face to face with new animals, white wolf, fisher, salmon, wild goose, polar bear, and a score of others, big and little, that stop their silent hunting to look at the intruder curiously and without fear. In his turn he will lay aside his gun and his thoughts of killing for a moment, and watch these animals, with his heart as well as his eyes wide open, trying to see without prejudices just what things they are doing, and then to understand, if possible, why and how they do them. Why, for instance, the big arctic wolf spares the bull caribou that attacks him wantonly. Why the wild goose has no fear at home. Why the baby seals are white at birth. How the salmon climb the falls which they cannot jump and why they hasten back to the sea when they are hurt, how the whale speaks without a voice, and what makes the fisher confuse his trail, or leave beside it a tempting bait for you when you are following him. All these and twenty more curious things are waiting to be seen and understood at the end of the trail. The reader who has not followed such trails before will ask at once how many of these things are true. Every smallest incident recorded here is as true as careful and accurate observation can make it. In most of the following chapters, as well as in all previous volumes, will be found the direct results of my own experience among animals, and in the few cases where as stated plainly in the text, I have used the experience of other and wiser men, I have taken the facts from first-hand and accurate observers, and have then sifted them carefully, so as to retain only those that are in my own mind without a question as to their truth. In the long story of Wayeeses the White Wolf, for example, in which, for the greater interest, I have put the separate facts into a more or less connected biography. Every instant in this wolf's life, from his grasshopper hunting to the cunning caribou chase, and from the den in the rocks to the meeting of wolf and children on the storm-swept barrens, is minutely true to fact, and is based squarely upon my own observation and that of my Indians. In one case only, the story of Copsy the Salmon, I have ventured to make an exception to this rule of absolute accuracy. For years I have followed and watched the salmon from the sea to the head springs of his own river, and back again to the sea, and all that part of his story is entirely true to fact, but beyond the breakers and beneath the tide no man has ever followed or seen him. I was obliged, therefore, either to admit that part of his life, or to picture it as best I could from imagination, and the records of the salmon hatcheries and deep-sea trawlers. Of course, for the story's sake, I chose the latter course and this part of the record has little value beyond a purely literary one. It is a guess at possible truth, and not, like the rest of the book, a record of careful observation. If the reader finds himself often wondering at the courage or gentleness of intelligence of these free folk of the wilderness that need not trouble or puzzle him for an instant, he is not giving human traits to the beasts, but is simply finding, as all do find who watch animals closely, many things which awaken a sympathetic response in his own heart, and which he understands more or less clearly in precisely the same way that he understands himself and his own children. It is not choice but necessity which leads us to this way of looking at animals and of trying to understand them. If we had a developed animal psychology based upon the assumption that life in one creature is essentially different from life in another, and that the intelligence in a wolf's head, for instance, is of a radically different kind from the same intelligence in the head of some other animal with two legs instead of four, then we might use our knowledge to understand what we see upon these trails. But there is no such psychology, and the assumption itself is a groundless one. Nature is of one piece, and consistent throughout. The drop is like the ocean, though it bears no ships on its bosom. The tear on a child's cheek breaks the light into glorious color, as does the rainbow on the spray of Niagara. And the law that holds the mountains fast sleeps in the heart of every grain of sand on the seashore. When we wish to measure the interstellar spaces, we seek no new celestial unit, but apply confidently our own yardstick. And the chemistry that analyzes a baby's food serves equally well for the satellites of Jupiter. This is but an analogy, to be sure, but it serves to guide us in the realm of conscious life, which also seems of one piece and under one law. Inspired writers of every age have sought to comprehend 
even gods and angels, by the same human intelligence as they applied to the ants and the connies, and for some reason that they possessed but one measure of life. Love and hate, fear and courage, joy and grief, pain and pleasure, want and satisfaction. These things, which make so large a part of life, are found in animals as well as men, differing much in degree, but not at all in kind, from the same feelings in our own hearts. And we must measure them, if we are to understand them at all, by a common standard. To call a thing intelligence in one creature, and reflex action in another, or so to speak, of the same thing as love or kindness in one, and blind impulse in the other, is to be blinder ourselves than the impulse which is supposed to govern animals. Until, therefore, we have some new chemistry that will ignore atoms and atomic law, and some new psychology that ignores animal intelligence altogether, or regards it as under a radically different law from our own, we must apply that what we know of ourselves and our own motives to the smaller and weaker lives that are in some distant way akin to our own. To cover our own blindness and lack of observation, we often make a mystery and hocus-pocus of animal life by using the word instinct to cover it all. As if instinct were the mysterious and exclusive possession of the animals, and not a common heritage which we share with them in large measure. It is an unmeaning word at best, for no one has told us, except in the vaguest way, what instinct is, or has set the limit where instinct ends and conscious intelligence begins or has shown how far the primary instincts of a child differ from those of any other animal. On the other hand, one who watches animals closely and sympathetically must judge from what he sees that the motives which govern an animal's actions are often very much like our own, the difference being that the animal's motive is more simple and natural than ours, and that among the higher orders the greater part of an animal's life, playing, working, seeking food, making dens, outwitting other animals, avoiding traps and enemies, is not directed by a blind instinct, but by a very wide-awake intelligence. And this intelligence begins by the use of native powers, and is strengthened by their daily occupation, is encouraged and developed by the mother's training and example as she leads her little ones into the world, and is perfected by the animal's own experience, which he remembers in the face of new problems, precisely as we do. A wild animal's life may indeed be far below ours, but he lives much in that pleasant borderland between thought and feeling where we so often find ourselves in quiet moments, and there is no earthly need to make a mystery of him by talking vaguely of instinct. Since so much of his life corresponds to our own and becomes intelligible to us the moment we lay aside our prejudice or hostility and watch him with a patient and friendly interest. I make no claim whatever that animals reason or think or feel as men and women do. I have watched them too long for that and sitting beside the beaver's village in the still twilight of the wilderness, I find enough to occupy eyes and mind without making any comparison with the unquiet cities of men far away. But here before me is a life to be understood before it can be described. A life, not an automaton, with its own joys and fears, its own problems, and its own intelligence. And the only conceivable way for me to understand it is to put myself on a moment in its place and lay upon it the measure of the only life of which I have any direct knowledge or understanding, which is my own. And this, far from being visionary or hypersensitive, as the makers of mechanical natural history would have us believe, is the only rational, indeed the only possible, way of understanding any animal action. So whether one looks for the facts of animal life, or for the motives which govern it, the reader may follow these trails, as I first followed them, with the idea of seeing with his own eyes and understanding with his own heart. He will see many things that he does not understand, and so will listen with respect to Noel and old Tama, who for fifty seasons and more have lived close to the wood folk, and he will find at the end of every trail a real animal, as true to life as I am able to see and describe after many years of watching in the wilderness. William J. Long, Stamford, Connecticut, January 1905 End of preface. Section 1 of Northern Trails, Book 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa Jean. Northern Trails, Book 2. By William J. Long. In Quest of Waptonk the Wild, Part 1. A vast and lonely barren, covered deep with soft-colored mosses and surrounded by gloomy spruce woods, lies basking in the early morning sunshine. 
The first sea wind has just come to call it, swinging a fragrant censer over the earth and rolling up the mists that have covered it all night long. Under this fleecy, vanishing coverlet, the plain seems to stir and breathe deep of the morning incense, then stretch itself drowsily, like a grey wolf just awake. Here and there, little ponds or flashlets of shallow water blink and quiver in the light like sleepy eyes, or rest in soft winding shadows like the features and wrinkles of a grey, weather-beaten face. Silence broods over it, taking visible shape in the form of a solitary woods raven that hangs motionless, high in air, on sable, outstretched wings. No sign of life moves on the tranquil face of the earth or water. No sound breaks the restful stillness, save the cheeping of young plover hiding in the grey moss, and a low surge, like a sound in a dream, drifting over distant woods from where the waves break ranks on the unnamed shoals. And here, unexpectedly, as good things come at last, was the end of my long quest to find the home of Waptonk the wild goose. Ever since childhood I had sought him. In the spring he had always called to me from the high heavens, and something in the ring of his bugle call, something in the sight of that living arrowhead driving steadily northward, and something perhaps in his wild heart which found answer in the heart of a boy who had to stay on the farm while his soul was away to the wilderness. All these sights and sounds and unknown longings had bound me to the trail of Waptonk the Wild, and made me resolve some day to follow him, and find out what it was that called him northward, when brooks were free and big woods budding, and the spring impulse was in the heart of all living things. Later Waptonk had called to me again from the same heavens, but now the arrow had pointed southward, and the flight was altogether different. The lines of the wedge wavered, and were often broken. It held closer to earth, and was less certain in its magnificent onward rush. And the clear, full-throated bugle calls that had thrilled the boy's heart with their springtime clangor gave place to a curious, communicative chatter, in which almost every note rose at the end to a falsetto. Now and then a strong, clear note, deeper and more peremptory, would sound at the head of the wedge, and instantly the wings would cackle and answer, and swing into better line. But the cry had lost much of its joy and utter freedom, as the flight had lost its power and its swift certainty. I did not know then, in the autumn days, that these were mostly young birds which had never before followed the long trail, that at the head of every wedge was one of the old birds pointing out the headlands by which they shaped their course, that the flight was less certain because the goslings had not yet reached their full power and must rest by the way and that the cry was less stirring because spring no longer called them away by its throbbing love life and by the sweet home memories of quiet nesting places of the far northland. Rather, they were driven away from the things they loved, and now the security of the great, free, lonely wilderness must give place to constant watchfulness in a hostile land, where danger lurked and roared out upon them from every point and bay and feeding ground. No wonder the flight wavered, no wonder the young voices rose to falsetto in amazement at the change from the quiet little pond which had been all their world, to the vast panorama of seas and mountains and cities of men spread wide beneath their wings. Then in the autumn days the boy, like all the rest of the male population, in whom something of the old savage lingered under its coat of civilization, felt the hunter stir within him, and saw visions and dream dreams when the wild goose call from the heavens came down to him as a kind of challenge. When the weather was stormy and the flight was low, the boy would climb stealthily out of the rear window of the barn with a forbidden old musket close to his breast. Keeping the barn between his own line of flight and the kitchen windows, he would head across the brown fields into the woods, holding steadily and swiftly on his way to the little widow Dunkles, who kept an old grey goose. Sometimes he begged, sometimes he bribed, and sometimes, when flight was irresistible and the window away from home, he simply appropriated what he wanted with all his heart. There would be a rush among the fowls, squawking and quacking of hens and ducks, and one wild clarion yell from the old grey leg goose as she found herself in chancery. Then the boy would scoot and dodge away to the big pond in the woods, with the old musket at his trail, and the old grey goose gripped tight under his elbow, conk conking her resentment, but sensible enough, as all geese are when you take them right. Next scene in the little comedy. A boy hidden in the grass and bushes of a lonely point, scanning the heavens, as if at any moment they might open and let wondrous fall, and in front of him an old grey goose, with one foot anchored to a brick, swimming about 
and tip-tilting her tail to the skies as she splashed and probed the bottom for roots, graveling herself like a whole flock of geese in her wonder and delight at her strange surroundings. And when at last the wild geese came, and out of the sky came tumbling down the stirring clangor, how the centuries of domestic servitude fell away from the old grey leg like a useless garment, tugging at the stupid brick with outstretched neck and quivering wings. She recognized her own people, and sent up a wild cry to call them down to share her loneliness. Perhaps, who knows, to come and take her away with them. Then the boy, hugging himself and holding his breath, and loving the old goose supremely for her help, would lie still as a stone, only his eyes moving to follow the flight of the wild birds, and see if they would come down to his bidding. Generally the wedge kept steadily on, straight and true to its course, but every head was bent to bugle down an answer to the captive. Then the boy's heart was touched in turning away from the high flight to watch his old grey lag, beating her useless wings, struggling after her kindred, as far as the anchor string would allow. She would call and call, and all the wilderness of the lonely Northland was in her appealing summons. Long after the clangor had died away to a faint crackle, and vanished in immeasurable distance, she would sit listening, with neck upstretched, hearing, and in her heart answering, the call which had died away on the boy's less sympathetic ears. After that there would be no more joy scabbling from Greyleg. She would swim about silently, now pecking angrily at the restraining string, now raising her head to look and listen for her wild kindred, till twilight fell sadly on the pond, and she would go home mute and passive under the boy's arm again. One stormy day, Great Luck headed towards the boy, and made his heart jump at the thought of at last meeting the grey wanderers of the upper air that had so often set his heart a-longing. A great gang of wild geese, flying lower than usual, with the sides of their wedge broken by the sleet, and irregular from weariness, passed into the pond on their southern migration. Their faint, confused honking roused all the wild longing in the heart of old Greyleg. Something, too, in their call, which she seemed to understand, made her sure they would come this time, and that she would know at last what the longing in her old heart meant. As she raised herself on her poor wings and sent out her clamorous appeal, the wild leader stopped, and the long wedge seemed to tumble together in a dense mass of cackle and confusion. Then the leader whirled. Above the clamor came the deep honk of authority. The lines formed swiftly, with marvelous precision, and straight up the pond to the boy's hiding place they came, a glorious big wedge of birds honking, honking in joy at so good a resting place, and nearly taking the heart out of old Greyleg as she clamored and tugged at her anchor and beat the water with her wings. Then all by himself the boy saw a bit of Waptonk's drill school, which old geese hunters on the coast have looked for so many years in vain. High overhead they came till over the middle of the pond when the leader whirled sharply to the right. The right-hand side of the wedge whirled after him, while the left wing halted, and then turned in behind the leaders in a single long line. Every wing was now set stiffly. The clangor suddenly ceased, and down they came, round and around in a beautiful spiral, as if sliding down on an invisible, winding staircase. Following the big leader came the long, magnificent line, which swung in a complete curve above him, and half around the circle again, all with set wings and outstretched necks, gliding, wheeling, curving, steadily downward in perfect order and perfect silence. It was marvelous the grace, the precision, the impressive silence of the stately procession down the spiral staircase of the winds, and the boy forgot the hunter in his intense wonder and admiration. One by one, the great birds dropped their black-webbed feet and slid gently along just over the surface for a brief moment, and then dropped with a quiet, restful splash into the water. An instant later, they had swung together, and a low, eager chatter began among them. Now old Greyleg alone had been unimpressed by this wonderful descent, for other things were stirring wildly in her lonely heart. All the while they were coming down, so silent and stately, she kept up an hysterical crackle with the wild beating of pinions and a frantic tugging at the anchor as she strove mightily to join her kindred, as they swung together with necks up suspiciously, for no wild waterfowl likes any welcome or demonstration beyond the universal uplifting of wings she ceased her wild struggle and called softly. Instantly the leader answered, and the whole flock drew in steadily towards the shore. 
Behind the rough screen of grass and bushes, the boy's heart began to beat loudly as he clutched his long musket. The hunter was wide awake again, and here were the geese, great splendid birds that never before were nearer than the heavens, almost within gunshot, driving steadily nearer and calling as they came on. In front of him, the old grey goose, full of a nameless excitement, jabbered back at the flock and swung rapidly in small circles about her anchor. Her excitement increased. The flock halted, wavered, veered aside. Then the heart of the old goose went after them in a wild honk, with a break in it like the fall of a tin pan, a tug, a plunge, a flurry of wings. The anchor string snapped, and away she went, half flying, half running over the water, and plunged in among the wild birds in a smother of spray. In an instant she was swallowed up in a dense circle of grey backs and slender black necks with white cheek patches, and the whole flock drew swiftly away into open water, cackling and jabbering softly with the nasal conk a conk of old grey legs sounding incessantly above the hushed chatter of her wild kindred. Late that day, after waiting long, cold hours in the vain hope that they would come near my hiding place, I pushed out sadly in a leaky old tub of a boat to catch the widow Dunkel's goose. The flock took alarm while I was yet far away, slanted heavily upwind to the treetops, where with much calling and answering, the young birds fell into line, and the wedge bore away swiftly seaward. After them went old Greyleg, heartbroken, beating her heavy way over the water, calling and calling again to the flock that had now become only a confused tangle of wild voices over the treetops. Straight to the shore she went, and across a little wild meadow, still following the flock. When I caught her, she was waddling bravely through the woods, stopping anon to call and listen. But she made no resistance when I tucked her under my elbow and carried her home and slipped her unobserved into the darkness, into her accustomed place at the widow Dunkel's duck coop. That was the nearest I ever came in boyhood days, to a close acquaintance with Waptonk the Wild, but always in the fall his voice roused the hunter as no other sound ever did, and always in the spring his clanging jubilate aroused the longing in the boy's heart to follow after him and find out what it was in the wild, lonely north that called him. Later, as a hunter, I grew acquainted with many of his winter ways, watched him feeding on the shoals or standing for sleep on the lonely sandbars, and thrilled to the rustling sweep of his broad wings as he swung over my decoys. End of section one. Section two of Northern Trails, book two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa Jean. Northern Trails, Book 2, by William J. Long. In Quest of Waptonk the Wild, Part 2. The trained geese which were often used, descendants of sundry wing-tipped or wounded birds that had been saved to breed in captivity, were very different from old grey lag. When the honk of wild geese was heard, and the long wedge wavered over the pond, these trained birds would be loosed to circle far out from the shore, and with wild clamour call down their wilder kinsfolk. Then slowly, cautiously, as if they knew well the treacherous work they were doing, they would lead the wild birds in towards the blind, to within range of the hidden gunners, when they would scatter suddenly and rush aside to get out of the way. And the decoyed and wandering geese would be left open to the murderous fire of the concealed hunters. An evil work, it seemed to me, in which I am glad to remember I took no part, beyond that of watching with intense interest and wondering at the cunning patience with which the old pot-hunter had trained his wild confederates. Watching these trained decoys one day, it was hard to realize that the birds were but yesterday the wildest and wariest of all the feathered folk. Then the startling paradox occurred to me, that the very wildest of the creatures are easier to tame by man, and the quickest to adopt his ways. The sparrows that live about our houses all their days have little fear of men, but at the first attempt to catch them they are suspicious for life, and to domesticate them would be an impossibility. So with the ruffled grouse, a very tame bird in his native wilderness that barely moves aside to let men pass, yet all attempts to domesticate him or to make him content with safe quarters and abundant fare have been, with a few rare exceptions, unaccountable failures. He lets you come near and watch him readily enough. But the moment you put him in your coop, the very spirit of wildness takes possession of him, and he dies in attempt to regain his freedom. The wild goose, on the other hand, the wariest and wildest of birds, 
when he comes among us in his migrations, giving wide berth to everything that has the least semblance to man or man's invention, and never letting you get within rifle shot, if his weary sentinels can detect your approach, will feed from your hand after he has been a few hours in your coop, and his descendants will take a permanent and contented place in your barnyard. In the spring when the migratory fever stirs within him, he will answer the clarion call of his fellows in the sky, and spread wings to join them. But that passes speedily, and he turns back to your dooryard, and seems content even with the clipped wing which keeps him there while his brothers and kinsfolk fade away in the cold blue distance. Cases have been known in which a wounded goose, having been kept all winter, has flown away with a passing flock into the unknown north during the spring migration, and returned the next fall to the same barnyard, bringing her brood with her. And so with the turkeys that range our fields, they are descendants of birds that by yesterday were ranging the woods as wild and unapproachable as wilderness ravens. The first great lesson I learned in the years of following the wild goose as a hunter was one of tremendous respect for his wariness and intelligence. To call a person a goose would be an exaggerated compliment, or a bit of pure flattery, if one but understood what he was saying. Wherever he feeds in the open, Waptonk has his sentinels posted on the highest points of observation, wise old birds that know their business, and it is next to impossible to approach a flock without being detected. Once it was enough to lead a cow slowly towards where the birds were feeding, on the stubble, and keep yourself hidden on the farther side of the grazing animal. But now Waptonk looks keenly under every cow, to see if she has an extra pair of legs or no, and so other devices must be invented only to be quickly fathomed by Waptonk's nimble wit, and then cast aside with the others as useless things. On the coast he still listens to the voice of his kind, and comes to the train decoys, and on the prairies a deep pit with wounded birds tied to stakes all about it, and honking to their fellows will sometimes bring him near enough for a quick shot. But these unfair advantages are in themselves a confession of man's failure since by his own wit, and aided by modern firearms, he is no longer able to contend with the wit of a goose. Elsewhere, especially in the great wheat fields of the southwest, there is a humorous confession of man's impotence, and Waptonk's superiority in the queer goose cavalry, horsemen that go shooting and shouting about to frighten away from the growing wheat the thronging thousands of wild geese that cannot be circumvented or destroyed. And the most ridiculous thing in the whole proceeding is that the goose cavalrymen must fume and fret under the thought that the exasperating birds understand him perfectly. They feed and gabble away serenely, paying no more serious heed to him than to any other scarecrow, until just before he gallops up, or foolishly tries to creep within range behind his horse, when the sentinel gives the alarm and the whole flock takes wing and settles down comfortably to feed in another part of the same wheat field. All this is the more remarkable, in view of the fact that this marvellous shrewdness with which Waptonk evades the best inventions of men, far from being a matter of instinct, is imparted to him on the spot by his wise old leaders. For untold generations he has been born and bred in the waste places of the north, where he sees no man, and where his life is singularly carefree and fearless. When he starts southward for the first time, full-grown and strong of wing, he knows absolutely nothing of the world of men. Left to himself and his own instincts, he would speedily tumble into the first cunning pitfall, as his ancestors did, when they met for the first time the white man and his devices. Then old and young alike had little fear of man, as they have now in their wild northern home, and met him with only the ordinary wild creature's watchfulness. But in a few seasons they learn better, and now the chief concern of the old birds on the southern migration is to keep the young well away from things that are dangerous. Fortunately for the young goose, his parents always lead the flock of which he is a part, and from them and from the old leaders trained in the school of long experience, he speedily learns to shift for himself and to make his own way in a world of wits. All these and many more things the boy has learned as he followed Waptonk with the hunters, but still his chief question remained unanswered. From books and baymen alike, from explorers and the shrewd old pot hunter of the Middleborough ponds, he heard always the same story, how the honking wedge might be called down to decoys, and how the wary birds might be told or trapped or outwitted and killed. But what Waptonk was as a living creature, what thoughts were in his head, and what feelings in his heart, when he was far from men, in his own home where he could be himself, that problem nobody answered. Something to be killed rather than a living thing to be known and understood was what met the boy at every turn and hushed his questions. 
and always in the spring when the wild call of the wide voyagers floated down from the blue heavens and the boy's eyes followed eagerly the rush of the great living wedge sweeping northward to love and liberty something new and strange yet familiar as the spring or sunrise stirred and awoke in the boy's heart and made him long to follow that is no strange experience i think something stirs in the hearts of most men and sweeps the years away and makes them boys again with the impulse to wander and to do splendid things far away when the first jubilant trumpet clangor of the wild goose comes down to them in the spring twilight it was no surprise therefore but only the fulfilment of many years of quiet expectancy when i crept out of the low spruces away up in the northern peninsula of newfoundland and found the end of my long quest a subdued chatter of wild voices had called me softly above the steady murmur of the river as i stole through the woods to the salmon pool in the early june morning following the sounds which seemed very near at first but which faded away like a will-o'-the-wisp when i tried to find them they led me away from the river and out of the big woods to where an unknown baron lay just awake under the sunrise greeting the intruder with the silent questioning look of the wilderness and there close at hand in a little flashlit was Waptonk the Wild, waiting quietly, as if he had always expected me. Still and secret as my approach had been, with that curious unconscious effort to efface himself that marks the going of a man or an animal alone in the great wilderness, Waptonk had been watching me for some moments before I saw him. He was resting quietly in the middle of the flashlit, a splendid big gander, with a soft grey body that almost lost its outline against the grey shore, and glossy black neck standing straight up from the water, and a pure white cravat rising on either side to his cheeks, like the immaculate choker of the old-fashioned New England minister. All the wilderness and weariness seemed to have fallen away from him, as a man drops a useless garment when he enters his own home. He looked at me steadily, quietly, without fear, with a certain sense of dignity in every strong, graceful line of his body, and with an unmistakable sense of his responsibility in guarding that which was hidden away somewhere on the farther shore. My first wondering impression was, can this be the same bird that I have followed so long in vain, whose name in the expression a wild goose chase is a symbol for all that is hopeless and inapproachable? There he sat, quiet, self-contained, without a tremor of fear or curiosity, and with no intention, so far as my eyes could discover, either to approach or to fly away. I drew near quietly and sat down on the shore, while Waptonk swung easily back and forth, on a short beat in front of me. As the minutes passed, I made no hostile sound or movement. The short patrol increased its swing till it covered an irregular half-circle, whose center was a point on the farther shore, and I knew then where I should find his nest and grey mate. Presently he began to talk, a curious low gabble. Out of the grass and moss on the point rose a head and long dark neck, to look at me steadily. Near were low cheepings and whistlings, where the goslings had been hiding in silence till the danger passed by. I rose at this, having found his secret, and made my way round the pond with immense caution because of the quaking bogs and bottomless black mud that lurked under my feet at every step. Waptonk stopped his patrol to watch me a moment, then followed closely, keeping just abreast of me, as I made my slow way along the treacherous shore. When I doubled the end of the little pond, and drew near to where his nestlings were hidden, Waptonk turned to the shore, and hurried to his mate ahead of me. A moment he stood over her reassuringly, bending to intertwine his neck with hers, and to rub his cheek softly over her wings, with a gesture that could only mean a caress. His head bent lower still, to touch for an instant, the goslings that were hidden in the moss. Then he left them abruptly, and rushed to where I was standing watching the amazing scene, and drew up defiantly, squarely across my path. An involuntary thrill of admiration ran over me as I looked down at him, standing there so strong and confident, ready to defend his own. "'You splendid fellow, you brave knight, if ever there was one among the feathered folk,' I kept saying to myself. But I wanted to test him farther, and especially I wanted to see all that was hidden in the grey moss. So I started forward again, cautiously. At the first step a lightning transformation swept over Waptonk, Big as he was, he ruffled all his feathers, and half spread his great wings till he looked twice his own size, and formidable enough to scare any prowler. Another step, then his eyes flashed, and lowering his head and black neck close to the ground, he rushed straight at me, hissing like forty snakes. 
and with a gasping, terrifying cackle in his throat, as if his rage were choking him. It was magnificent, this swift change from quiet dignity to raging defiance of an enemy ten times his size. The fierce hissing got into my nerves, spite myself, and made me wonder if any wild animals, living constantly, as animals do, on the thin edge of flight and panic, could stand up against the terrifying sound for a moment. I remembered the time when, as a little boy, I had been soundly drubbed and beaten out of the barnyard by an irate old gander, and watched now the great wings with a lively memory of what blows they could deal. Like a man caught in a fault, I had absolutely no defence, for Waptonk was on his own ground, and I had no business whatever in meddling with his affairs. To throw myself upon him, therefore, and by brute force to overcome the noble fellow defending his little ones, was out of the question, as plainly impossible as to rob a bird's nest or to beat a child. But suppose Noel, my big Indian, should chance that way on his perpetual quest for new beaver ground. I could see the queer squint in his eye and the grin on his wrinkled face as he watched me hopping over the bogs with the old gander nipping at my heels and spanking me with the broad wings as he chased me gloriously out of his bellowick. That was too much even for the sake of encouraging Waptonk as he deserved. So instead of running away, I sank down quietly in the moss, waiting half-humorously to take my medicine and fully expecting to get it good and plenty. Quite near me he stopped, his head down close to the ground, his tongue bent up like a spring in the roof of his mouth, hissing vigorously and watching me keenly out of his bright eyes to see the effect of his demonstration. It flashed upon me instantly why he bristled his feathers and raised his wings while he carried his neck and head down close to the ground like a big snake. The wings, his only weapons, were half raised for a blow, but the fierce hissing yet harmless head would surely hold the attention of any attacking animal, just as an owl snaps its beak to frighten you and keep your eyes away from his dangerous claws until he gets them into you unexpectedly. Any wild animal, if you are brave enough to attack, would naturally avoid the snake-like hissing and leap over it for the larger body, only to be met by a stinging blow in the face from the powerful wings. If the delicate neck were carried high, any animal would naturally leap for it, and Waptonk's fight would be over almost before he could strike a blow. As it is, Waptonk carries his most vulnerable point as close to the ground as possible, as a ship carries her magazine below the waterline, and by scaring an animal with his snake-like hiss, he gets a fair chance to use his weapons, and so takes care of himself splendidly against all prowlers. End of section 2《Section 3 of Northern Trails Book 2. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa Jean. Northern Trails Book 2 by William J. Long. In Quest of Waptonk the Wild, Part 3. Waptonk was evidently amazed at my quiet. Having expected either fight or flight, he was thrown off his balance and hardly knew how to meet the emergency. I fancied I could see it in his eyes as he looked at me steadily. A moment or two he kept his defensive attitude till the hissing gradually died away. He raised himself suddenly and threshed his great wings in my face. I could feel the strong wind of them on my cheek and measure the nervous muscular beat under his feathers as he tried their power. Then he put his head down to the ground and hissed again, daring me to come on. Ten yards behind him sat his mate, her head raised out of the grass, watching us steadily without a sound. Suddenly she uttered a low call with a curious accent of warning and reassurance. It was a communication to her champion, plainly enough, for he wavered slightly for the first time from his intense attitude. The next moment she slipped out of the grass into the pond, and after her came five goslings, alert little bundles of yellow-brown fuzz that walked steadily across the shore, with a funny effect of carrying their knees up close to their shoulders, and glided easily into the friendly waters. There was another low call from the grey mate. Then Waptonk, though he had not turned his head, nor taken his keen eyes for an instant from my face, turned swiftly aside and threw himself into the water. A push or two from his powerful webs, and he was floating safely far beyond my reach, still looking back at me alertly over his shoulder as he surged away. The little family glided swiftly along the pond shore, the mother leading them and talking to them reassuringly. Behind them and me hovered Waptonk, swinging back and forth on his watchful patrol till they disappeared from sight. 
Then he glided silently after them into a muddy lagoon where the treacherous bogs forbade any human foot to follow. An hour later the little wild family stole shyly out of the haven where they had hidden, and found me sitting quietly just where I had first appeared. If they were surprised or uneasy, they gave no sign of their feelings beyond a bright, inquisitive look, but swam slowly past me, and climbed the bank where it was worn hard by their feet, and started across the barren on their day's foraging. For hours I followed them, keeping out of sight as much as possible, watching with keenest interest their feelings and discipline, and noting especially the crude beginnings of that wedge formation with which they would later make their first long flight southward ahead of the autumn gales. Wherever they went, Waptonk, the big gander was near them, hovering on the outskirts, or watching them keenly from every little hillock that commanded a wider view of the great barren. He ate but little, and apparently only incidentally. His whole business seemed to be to guard his little flock, while the mother led them about to feed, or train them to the perfect discipline that is the wonder of all those who have ever watched wild geese. And when at midday the feeding was done, and the goslings were sunning themselves on the bank of another flashlit under the mother's eye, Waptonk took wing and bore away swiftly over the woods and marshes to the ocean, as if in his cramped life he wanted room and exercise, or perhaps just a glimpse of the wide sea which he loved, as all others do who have once felt the spell of its boundless mystery. For within the hour he was back again, as usual, standing guard over his own. Later, as I had returned day after day to watch the grey voyages that had so long attracted me, I saw a rare bit of Waptonk's care and sagacity, one of the goslings, more headstrong than the others, in wandering away from the leader over a treacherous bit of bogland, found himself stogged in some soft mud that he attempted to cross too hurriedly and carelessly. He floundered desperately for a moment, called sharply, and then lay perfectly quiet, with wings extended on the mud to keep himself from sinking deeper. Instantly, the mother bird called all the young close about her, raised her neck high to look over them at her helpless gosling, and then turned her head and honked deeply to the gander. Waptonk had already seen the danger from his point of vantage, and rose heavily in the air, circling once with bent head over the little fellow in the mud, as if to understand the situation. He turned and flapped over him, reaching down to seize a wing in his bill. So with the youngster kicking vigorously, and flapping his free wing to help himself, he half dragged and half carried his careless offspring over the mud, and hiked him out upon the moss with a final unnecessary jerk that seemed to tell him roughly to take better care of himself another time. But he lowered his head to rub his cheek softly down the little fellow's neck and over his wings, again and again, before he walked quietly away to his post as if nothing whatever had happened. Then came the final scene, which made me tingle in my hiding, increasing the strong desire that rarely leaves me to understand what passes in the heads and hearts of the wood folk. The mother went to the careless one and brought him back to where the flock was waiting. Then standing in the midst of her brood, she seemed to be talking to them, first in a low chatter, then in a strange, silent communication, in which not a muscle moved, but in which every neck was raised in the attitude of tense attention. A moment later, the flock was moving across the barren, cheeping, whistling, feeding as before. Late in the afternoon, as I watched by the home flashlit, there was another scene altogether different, and here were many things that a man could not be expected to understand though I saw and admired them often enough. As the sun sank and the pointed shadows of the spruce came creeping out across the barren, the little flock came wandering back, as is the custom with wild geese, to spend the night by the nest where they were born, and to sleep contentedly under their mother's wing, while the old gander kept watch and ward in the darkness. For Waptonk is more of a land bird than any of the ducks. The forward set of his legs shows that nature intended him to walk as well as swim, and he will never sleep in the water if he can find a safe and quiet spot to rest on the shore. At sight of the familiar place, the little family that I had watched all day long suddenly stopped their hungry wandering and came running in a close group, heads all up and whistling, to tumble down the slope and throw themselves with glad splashes into the friendly water, which was all aglow now with the splendors of the sunset. There they drank and washed themselves and played together in their little races and scuffles, and stopped their play to stretch their necks down to the oozy bottom for roots that they had overlooked, or for earth and pebbles to aid their digestion. Then, as the shadows lengthened, they glided to an open spot on the bank to preen and gabble softly, while the big parent birds, their own preening finished as they watched the play of their little ones, went from one to another, rubbing them tenderly with their white cheeks, chattering over each one in turn, 
and in twenty little indescribable ways of showing their fondness their gladness also that the long good day was done and they were safe at home once more perhaps this was all imagination but even so a man must look in his heart not in the psychologies or natural histories if he would understand half of what the wood folk are doing here before my eyes was a little family that had come back in the sunset after much wandering and some danger to the one spot in the great wilderness that they knew well where life began for the goslings and where each familiar thing seemed to welcome them and make them feel at home over them stood the parents strong and watchful against the world but bending their necks tenderly to tell their little ones by the soft caress of their cheeks that they loved and understood them a low contented gabble filled the twilight stillness unintelligible perhaps yet telling plainly by its changing accents the goslings changing feelings from the day's bright excitements to the evening's sleepy content and recalling to me in a sudden wave of tenderness the chatter of a little child far away in the same twilight who could speak no words yet but whose feelings i could understand perfectly as she talked back to the friendly universe and then crooned herself and her dolly to sleep alone in her own little crib a great tide of light rolled suddenly over the plain from the west as the clouds lifted bathing all things in a rosy splendor and the young birds stopped their chatter to turn their heads and watch silently for a moment as the glory swept over them and the voices were different more hushed and sleepy yet with a slight note of wonder like birds wakened by a light when i heard them again in the nearest thicket a choir of thrushes were ringing the angulus nearer a solitary vesper sparrow hidden in the gray moss was singing his hymn to the evening an unknown call floated down from the distant hills a fox barked in answer while the river hushed its roar as the night fell and went singing down on its way to the sea and to all these sounds and to every wave of light and passing shadow and restless wing of the eddying plovers the young birds responded instantly with low cheeps and whistles drawing nearer and nearer together to feel a last touch of their parents white cheeks while i lay and watched them myself drifting away into that delicious borderland of feeling and sense impression in which the young birds live so constantly where all conscious thought vanishes and one becomes alive in every nerve and fingertip to the sights and sounds and subtle harmonies of the world for nature not only reveals herself but some beautiful and forgotten part of a man's own soul when she finds him responsive in the wilderness slowly the glory deepened and faded and the crimson flush that had spread wide over the great barren came creeping back into the west out of which it had come after it came the silence hushing the gosling's chatter and the bird's hymn and only the river was left singing to itself through the listening woods over the vast plain came again the sea wind swinging its fragrant censer from which fell now only heavy and drowsy odors and the fleecy mists that i had seen rise at dawn settled softly again to cover the sleeping earth like a garment i could no longer see the birds that i had followed all the long sunny day but where the little family stood a soft grey shadow blurred the open shore and from it came now and then a sleepy inquisitive peep as some little one stirred uneasily and then a deep quiet answer to tell him that all was well and that he was not alone in the darkness that was my first real meeting with Laptonk, my first answer to the question which had always been in my heart and which neither the books nor the hunters could answer as to what he was like in his own land where the guns and decoys of men might not enter and i was satisfied perfectly satisfied as i turned away in the twilight across the wild barren to where my little tent by the salmon river was waiting end of in quest of laptonk the wild end of section three Section 4 of Northern Trails, Book 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Melissa Jean. Northern Trails, Book 2. By William J. Long. Pequam the Fisher, Part 1. Pequam the Fisher, the cunning one, as Simo calls him, who follows your snowshoe track but never crosses it, is one of the shadows of the big woods. A dark shadow indeed to the wood folk, for wherever he goes, death follows close behind him. And a shadow to your eyes also, for when you do see him unexpectedly after much watching and patience he darts up the hillside leaping and dodging vanishing and appearing and vanishing again like one of the shadows that the sunbeams are chasing when a brisk wind drives the clouds away and when the woods are filled with rustlings and uncertainties why is he called the fisher that is one of the great mysteries ask the half-breeds of the great barren grounds and they may tell you perhaps 
that he is called Fisher because he is a most industrious thief in stealing the fish with which they bait their traps, in angling them out of the cunning devices without getting his own paw caught, or bringing the heavy deadfall down on his own back. The name Weejack, however, which still clings to him there, has no thought of fish or fishing in it, but suggests rather the elves and goblins, the cunning and mischievous little folk, that are supposed to haunt the solitudes and play havoc with the trapper's sable line. The earlier naturalists, catching rare glimpses of Pequam, and trusting to their own knowledge rather than to the Indians' better understanding, probably called him Fisher because they confused him with Keonk the Otter, whom he slightly resembles, and who is a famous fisherman. Like all weasels, and next to Karakjo the wolverine, he is greatest and fiercest of his tribe. He likes fish, but I have never known him to catch one unaided save once, and then he leapt into a shallow pool among the rocks, where receding waters had left a big salmon half-stranded, and darted about like a fury in a blinding smother of water till he gripped his slippery prize securely and dragged him away into the shadows. Pequam has other names. Black Fox he is called in places, where he is but rarely seen, though he bears no relation to the black or silver fox, and Penance Martin by the bookish people, and Black Cat by all the main trappers who follow him on the snow springs when he is gorged with food, and who catch him cunningly at last asleep in a hollow log. But that is the only way I have ever tried in which I have really caught a weasel asleep. But whatever his name, Pequam has the same nature wherever I have found or heard of him, whether on the high mountain ranges, or the bleak Labrador barrens, or the silent shadow-filled northern woods, a crafty, restless, bloodthirsty haunter of every trail, even your own, at once shy and daring, springing in tense alarm at the slightest unknown squeak or chirp or rustle, yet with a screeching ferocity at times when you corner him that makes your spine tingle. Because he is little known, even to the naturalists, let me describe him just as you meet him at home in the woods. If you see him at all, which is not likely unless you follow him for miles on the snow, and find his kill and then track him to his den, you will be conscious chiefly of a black streak drawn swiftly up the hillside and vanishing over the top of a rock or a mossy log. If you get any idea of the creature at all, it will be something like that of an enormous black cat with a terrier in swift pursuit. If he but stand for an instant to see what frightened him and give you one of the rare sights in the woods, you will see an exceedingly nervous animal, suggesting at once a cat and a huge weasel. He is much larger than a house cat, with short legs and a pointed face, like a marten's, and glossy black fur. That is as far as you will ever get in your description, except perhaps the tail, which you see, is long and soft and glossy as he vanishes over the log. And, like many a scared cat, he fluffs it out like a bottle brush, to make it look big and to scare you should you attempt to follow him. Two or three times in the woods I have had just such glimpses of Pequam as I have described, but except in hunting on the snow, only once I have seen him plainly, where he had no idea I was watching him. I was sitting quietly in the woods at daybreak, watching for deer and moose on Matagammon, when there was a rustle behind me, and Mokotox went hopping by in the crazy, erratic way that hares have when hunted. Kagax is after him, I thought, and turned to watch for the weasel, at the same time picking up a stick to stop the bloodthirsty little wretch's hunting. Then out of the underbrush darted Pequam, his muzzle twitching, tail quivering, darting, leaping, dodging, halting, all on fire with excitement. Every hair on his body seemed to be alive and filled with nerves, and I thought instantly of a young fisher that I used to watch for hours at a time in his cage. Whether sleeping or waking, on the ground or in his tree, he seemed to have eyes, ears, and senses all over him. A squeak, a chirp, a scratch, the slightest sound, and instantly he leaped from what he was doing, and twisted his head, and whirled and leaped again. Once, when he was apparently sound asleep, I brought my thumb and fingers together, and snapped the edges. A sound so faint would hardly trouble the dreams of even a sleeping wolf. But on the instant, Pequam had leaped to his feet, wide awake, and was wrinkling his nose in my direction. Just the same impression of intense vitality and alertness swept over me now, as the wild creature passed before me fairly quivering from nose to tail tip. Not ten feet from my hand, where the hare had made a wild jump, he stopped for an instant, twisted his head in a half-circle to catch the scent, darted forward, ran back again with his nose to the ground, and then finding he was off-scent and running back a track instead of turning as any other animal would have done, he simply leaped, whirled in the air like a flash, and came down on his tracks facing in the opposite direction. It was the quickest, the most intense action I have ever seen in a living animal, 
and yet it was probably just an ordinary movement in Pequam's daily life. An instant later he had picked up the trail and darted away, absolutely unconscious that I had watched him. As a hunter, Pequam has no equal among the wood folk. He follows a trail with all the persistency of a weasel, and he darts forward with marvellous quickness when his nose has brought him within striking distance of his game. Of a score of fisher trails that I have followed in the winter woods, never a one but brought me sooner or later to the scene of his killing, with its record written as plainly as if the eye had seen it all. You may follow the tracks of Elomos the fox, the sly one as Simo calls him, for days at a time, and find only that he has caught nothing and has lain down to sleep far more hungry than you are yourself. Or you may trace the round, deep pugs of Upweekis the link for uncounted miles through the bare, white, empty woods, and get at last a kind of sympathy for the big, savage, stupid fellow as you think how ravenous he must be, for the tracks lead to nothing but disappointments. At the beaver house, at the rabbit's form, beside the deer yard, and at the hole in the snow, where the grouse plunged for the night. But follow Pequam a little way, and you come speedily to the story of good hunting. Here a mouse, and there a hare, and there a squirrel, and there a deer. Careful now. He is gorged and sleepy, and you will find him, not far away, asleep in a hollow tree under the snow. Spite of his size, Pequam climbs and moves among the big trees, with all the sureness and agility of a squirrel, traveling long distances overhead, and even following his game by leaping from branch to branch. Like the squirrel, he can jump down from an enormous height, flattening his body and tail against the air so as to break his fall, striking the ground lightly, and darting away as if he enjoyed the dizzy plunge. And like the larger cats, he sometimes creeps over his game on a lofty limb, and leaps down upon it like a thunderbolt. Though unlike Peacomp, the wild cat, and Lox, the panther, I have never known him to watch in a tree over the runways. His nose is too good and his patience too poor to lead him to these pot-hunting and abominable methods. It is in following Pequam's trail through the snow that you learn, as you do with most large animals, the story of his life. For the northern forests, in winter especially, seem but bare and tenantless places. Far in the south, life seems to be the order of the universe. Earth, air, and water swarm at all times with a multitude of creatures. Here, all is different. Silence and death seem to have gripped the world and emptied it. From early morning, when the intense cold silences all things, to the short midday, when the feeble sun brings forth a jay's cry or a squirrel's disturbing chatter, and on to the early twilight, when the trees groan again and crack like pistols as the frost snaps the tightening bark, you glide along silently and alone on your snowshoes, and save for the crossbills and chickadees and the rolling tattoo of the log cock you seem utterly alone in the universe. No broad wing or gloss of fur or grey shadow of a deer disturbs the sharp outlines of the still tree balls on every hand. Your own breath as it drifts away in a cloud of frost among the trees is the only sign of a living animal in all the snowy landscape. Now look down at your feet. You are standing where the dainty trail of a fox crosses the broad lead of a porcupine and it follows a little way doubtfully. Elimos is uncertain. You see whether to turn aside or to go on. Debating with his shrunken stomach whether or not he is hungry enough to risk being struck through with cruel barbs for a coarse mouthful, undecided whether to follow Unkwunk and perhaps find him safe in a tree, or trust again to luck and patience for a sweeter mouthful to stand between poor fox and death. There he follows the trail, and by that you may know he is more than hungry. End of section 4section 5 of northern trails book 2 this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by melissa jean northern trails book 2 by william j long pequam the fisher part 2 life is here you see though it is now hidden away where it takes more than eyes to find it tracks are everywhere all kinds of tracks telling their stories of last night's wanderings from the dainty tracery of the woodmice to the half-filled path that leads you to the moose yard on the other side of the great ridge Follow any of them and you find life, or the plain record of life, that goes swiftly and silently about its chief end and concerns itself diligently about its own business. There, a little farther on, are your own snowshoe slots of yesterday, and see close behind them, following every turn and winding of your trail, but never crossing it, are the cunning tracks of Pequam the fisher. Clear to your camp in a five-mile circle he followed your trail, and even now behind you, 
he may be sniffing again at the new, strange tracks that rouse his curiosity. Once feeling that I was followed, I stole back cautiously and caught him hanging to my heels like a shadow. But why he follows my trail I have never been able to find out. It is a good plan in the winter woods to scatter food along your trail, for it overcomes the wood folk's distrust of man's footprints. But long before I found that out and practiced it, Pequam had followed me. Perhaps he had followed the trappers so long to steal the bait from their marten traps that it had become a habit. It was on a morning like this, still and cold and lifeless, that I left the big lumber camp on the Dungavon and struck off eastward for the barrens. I was after Caribou, but two miles away in the woods I ran across old Newell the Indian, whose hunting camp was far up on the river, moving swiftly along with his eyes on a fresh trail. "'Hello, brother. What you hunt him?' I hailed him. For answer, he pointed with a grunt to the snow, where a fisher had gone along that morning, as if someone were after him. "'Pequam in a hurry this morning. Thinks if new wool around, fisher better mog along somewhere else,' I ventured. And the grim old face before me softened at the tribute to his skill in hunting. "'Oh, I get him,' he said, smiling. "'Dust a fellow rob my sapel traps. Find him where he killed deer this morning.' Now he go off with his belly full, sleepy, oh sleepy. Find him by and by, pretty soon quick now. You want to go along help him? He added invitingly. That was a new kind of hunting for me, so I left the caribou gladly and followed the old Indian. He had no gun, only an axe, and I was curious to know how he intended to catch so spry and wary an animal unaided. But I asked no questions, following silently and keeping out to one side of the trail looking far ahead for a glimpse and a possible shot at Pequam among the trees. Indeed, it was probably the sight of my rifle and a light axe at my belt that caused Newell to issue his invitation. The fisher was plainly suspicious or alarmed, for he was traveling rapidly, yet with marvelous craftiness. Newell assured me that Pequam had neither seen nor smelled him. Probably he had eaten full and was now minded to lie down for a long sleep, and like a bear seeking a winter den after the tell-tale snow has fallen, was making a cunning trail to deceive and mislead any that might try to find him. This was my own explanation, and good enough for the moment. But later Newell gave a very different reasoning for the crooked trail we were following. Again and again, the trail doubled back on itself, where Pequon came back for a distance, stepping in his own footprints, and then leaped away in a great side jump into some thick cover where his new tracks were hidden. Newell, who was watching for such things, generally saw the trick and turned aside, but more than once he was deceived and we went on to find the trail ending abruptly with a single footprint in the snow. Then we would turn back and hunt on either side till we picked up the trail again. Twice the tracks ended at the foot of a great tree, where Pequam had climbed and ran among the branches overhead, and then we had to circle widely to find where he had leaped down and run on again. Once he tunneled for a long distance under the snow, and when we found the trail it was far out to one side and running at right angles to his former course. So we followed him, mile after mile, and I had long given up the thought of shooting in the fascination of working out the riddle which Pequam had spread for us, when Newell, who had been growing more and more cautious for the past ten minutes, stopped suddenly and pointed ahead. And when I glided up to him there was no sign of a den or a hidden log, but only a little hollow, half filled with a flurry of snow, where the trail disappeared, as if Pequam had suddenly taken wings to himself and flown away. "'Where is he?' I whispered. Oh, we got him now. Good place, chuckled Newell. Pequam think he fool him old Injun. Hides he footing. Now he think safe. Go sleep. Guess he fool self this time. By kosh, oh by kosh. From a great hole in the top of a fallen log, fifty feet away, a black streak shot out and vanished in a flurry of snow. Pequam, instead of going in at this hole, had tunneled out of sight for ten or fifteen feet and had gone in at the opposite end of the log, which was hidden in the deep snow and bending evergreens. A cunning trick, for any one approaching the half-buried log would see the inviting hole at the top, but find no track leading up to it, and so would conclude naturally that the den was unoccupied. Had we been an hour later, we would have found him heavy with sleep in the log, but we had followed too hot on his trail. He had barely settled himself down in his warm den under the snow when our approach startled him, and he was off on another crooked trail. We stopped where we were to buy a kittle for the cold of the northern forests is killing in its intensity, and the moment you cease action, that moment nature clamors for fire and food with an insistence never known elsewhere. Late in the afternoon, after following the fresh trail through all its doublings and windings, 
we came to where it leaped aside, without warning, into a dense thicket of low firs. There it ended, as if the ground had been opened to swallow Pequam. But just beyond, a long mound showed where a fallen log lay buried under the snow, and we knew we should find him there, fast asleep. Unslipping the light axe, I moved cautiously to the smaller end of the log, while Newell crouched at the butt, and began to shovel aside the snow with a snowshoe. My end of the log was solid. In the whole shell after I had laid it bare of snow, I found only a single hole, and that hardly big enough to admit a squirrel. Meanwhile, Newell had pushed a pole into the hollow butt till it was seized savagely and almost jerked out of his hand. A fierce snarl and a muffled scratching told us plainly that we had at last reached the end of the trail. Very deliberately, the old Indian cut a dozen more poles, while I stood guard, and wedged them tightly into the hollow butt. Next he enlarged the squirrel hole, and I had a glimpse of glossy fur as Pequam rushed towards the place where he had entered, only to find it securely shut. The squirrel hole was then closed by stakes driven through the rotten wood beneath, and Pequam was caught with only some six feet of hollow shell to rage around in. I confess I would gladly enough have stopped here, for the sight of any trapped animal, however fierce, that has known all its life only absolute liberty, always awakens in me the desire to break its bars and set it free again. But Newell had no such scruples. Here was a prime fur worth eight dollars, to say nothing of plundered martin traps. The fire that sleeps in an Indian's eyes, and that always kindles at the sight of game, began to flash as he chopped a long notch through the top of the shell, driving in stakes as he advanced, and slowly but surely pinning Pequam into a space where a blow of the axe would finish it all. Through the narrow slit I could see him, the flash of his eye and the white gleam of his teeth under the brown muzzle as he tried the opening and then the sweep of his bushy tail as the axe drove him aside. Again and again he whirled on us savagely, for unlike the fox and bear that know when you have won and that lie down quietly for the blow, Pequam fights and defies you to the very end. Game killer and robber of traps he may be, but traps are barbarous things at best, and the animal that robs them is only saving some innocent life from suffering, though he knows it not. Here he was, the shadow of the woods, become solid substance at last, his marvellous cunning overmatched by man's intelligence. Not a chance left in the tough shell that held him fast, while the steel bit nearer and nearer, and the stakes pinned him in. And there was something magnificent, an appeal not to be answered lightly, in the way he clung to life, claimed it, fought for it, and screeched out at us defiantly that his life was his own and we must not take it away. "'Got him safe now,' I ventured at last. "'Safe,' grunted the Indian, between the steady chucks of his axe. "'By kosh, Pequam never safe till he dead, "'and den he fool me two, tree time when he only play dead. "'Best cock him dat gun. "'Pequam got plenty tricks he ain't try yet.' "'But there was no need of the gun, "'and I did not look to see the end. "'Before the short twilight had fallen on the woods, "'we had stroked the splendid fur and valued it, "'and were heading swiftly for the little hunting camp on the river, "'with Pequam's black coat, hanging limp and soft and warm between the Indian's shoulders. End of Pequam the Fisher End of Section 5section six of Northern Trails Book 2 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Melissa Jean Northern Trails Book 2 by William J. Long The Trail of the Cunning One, Part 1 That night, in the queer little hunting camp by the river, while the birch logs glowed on the stone hearth and sang for the last time the old songs which the winds had taught them, old Newell answered my questions about the fisher we had caught and told me of his lonely trapper's life and the many trails he had followed. Under his skillful hands as he worked, Pequam's glossy skin changed its face and crept down to the very end of the long cedar stretcher, ready at last to take its place in the row of marten and fox and otter pelts that hung outside, touched and made fragrant by the wood smoke and turning, turning for the last breath of the forest wind that stole in through the sides of the little Kamusi. What puzzled and interested me the most was the Indian's confident declaration that Pequam had neither seen nor winded him that morning, but had simply felt the presence of an enemy on his trail, and so had taken to doubling and travelling among the branches in order to throw him off the track. "'Now I tell you now,' he said earnestly, in answer to my suggestion that it was merely a precautionary measure such as the bear takes before denning for the winter? Pequam just same, all animals. No good many ting without knowing how he know. So long you just watch him animal, he don't fraid to all. Don't see, don't hear, don't smell. 
everything just right. Go on feeding, playing, feel good inside. Now you go get gun, follow his footing. By and by, he stop, wag his ears, sniff, sniff, look all round the hoods. Don't hear, don't see, don't smell nothing. Get afraid and run away just same. Plenty black cat in these woods. You follow and find out for yourself. It was the old question that one runs up against everywhere in the woods, and his own hunting, and in the experience of woodsmen, the unknown sixth sense, or feeling of danger, which sometimes warns a creature beyond the reach of any known sense, and which seems to imply a kind of silent mental communication among animals. Several times since then I have followed Pequam's trail, and learned something about his hunting, and in every case we have found much to justify the Indian's conclusion. When Pequam kills a large animal and gorges himself, he goes but a mile or two, often making less than that, and hides him away to sleep, making but slight effort to confuse his trail. Follow it now, quietly, and you see where it disappears in the snow, and somewhere just beyond you will find Pequam asleep in a hollow log. But if you find the fresh track where he returns to his kill, and follow it swiftly before he has settled down to sleep, he begins doubling and tunneling and travelling overhead, long before it would seem possible that any sight or sound or smell of you could drift away over the hills to where the cunning one is hiding his trail from the tell-tale snow. Once, while following a fresh track, old Newell had a curious experience of Pequam's cunning. And last summer, when I noticed a fisher's track on the shore of the grassy pond under Catdin, my guide told me, unasked, of a similar occurrence which he had himself witnessed last spring when he was trapping among the Swordnahook Mountains. Newell found where Pequam had killed a deer on the crust, and followed the trail through the soft snow that had fallen overnight, not half an hour after the fisher had left it. Mile after mile he swept along on his snowshoes, through the swamps and over the hills, pushing the fisher hard and unwinding swiftly every turn and double and side jump and tunnel in the cunning trail. Pequam was heavy and tired. Two or three times Newell saw him plainly, but with his old gun, whose lock he must protect from the snow, he was not quick enough for a shot. And still the game held on, and at every turn laid some new snarl or puzzle for the old Indian's eyes to unravel. Late in the afternoon, the trail turned abruptly from the ridge, which it had been following for miles, and headed straight and swift for a cedar swamp. There were plenty of deer here, the spring hunger had driven them out of their yards, and in the early morning, or late afternoon, when the crust hardened enough to bear their weight, they could get at the cedar boughs, which till then had been too high to reach. So long as they spread their legs, or went softly, the crust would bear them up, but at the first heavy plunge they sank through to their shoulders and were almost helpless. Halfway through the swamp, the hunted fisher winded a large deer and leapt straight at him. The track showed that it was not his usual crafty hunting but a straight, swift dive, with probably a savage snarl to add to the terror of his rush. At the first startled bound, Haytook, the buck, sank to his withers. A dozen more plunges, and he lay helpless. Pequam raced along, leapt for his throat, and gave the death wound. He watched for a moment, crouching in the snow, till the buck lay still. Then he ran on again, without stopping to eat or drink. Newell, far behind, puzzling out the trail, neither saw nor heard anything of the swift tragedy, but read it all from the snow a half hour later. Straight back to the hills went Pequam, leisurely, carelessly now, and without making the slightest effort to hide his trail, as he had done all day, crept into the first good hollow log and slept down to sleep. Newell found him there and wedged him in without trouble, and took his skin without sight of the spot where the deer lay stiffening in the snow. Now the curious thing about the killing is this, that Pequam was running for his life, with no time to lose or to throw away. He had already killed one deer, and had eaten more than he wanted, and, with an enemy after him, would disgorge some of what he had already carried, rather than take more to make him heavy. Indeed, after a kill and a full meal, Pequam, when no enemy is near, usually lies quiet for days at a time, drowsing away in his hollow log. A certain blind ferocity might, perhaps, account for his killing the deer, but that leaves his subsequent carelessness unaccounted for. And besides, unlike their smaller and more bloodthirsty kinsman the weasel, neither Fisher nor Martin seem to kill for the lust of killing. They kill only when hungry, and usually go back to any large game until it is eaten up to the very bones before they hunt or kill again. All this passed through my mind rapidly, and the Indian, in answer to my inquiries, confirmed my idea of the Fisher's ordinary habits. 
Then I put the final question. Why on earth, then, did Pequam kill another deer? Why he kill him that t'other deer? Cause he think Injun hungry, that's why he kill him. And then, as my eyes questioned his in the firelight, Why you suppose now, Pequam follow trail herself, just same I follow him all day, huh? Cause he hungry, cause he want meat. Dust why black cat, dust why wolf, dust why all animal follow trail all day long in snow. He hungry, he want meat. Bam by, roof, scratch, kill em deer. Eat em plenty, lie down sleep, don't follow trail no more. Now I follow Pequam, continued Newell earnestly. Just same he follow deer. Pequam hide, run, climb tree, go under snow, try fool injum. All time injun keep right on, through seed of swamp, up big hill, downside, everywhere, Pequam go, injun follows his footing. Bam by Pequam tink, injun hungry, injun want meat. Injun want him me. Then he go kill him dear. Ting perhaps Injun eat plenty meat. Go away. Don't follow his trail no more. Startling as the explanation, there was a grain of reason in it, and I give it because I have no other to offer. Years later, when I asked the main guide how he accounted for his fisher's actions, he gave precisely the same reason, though more than ten years and two countries and many hundreds of miles separated the two occurrences. The black cat, he said, must have thought or felt in his own dumb way that by killing a deer and leaving it there untouched, he might satisfy and turn aside the enemy that followed on his trail. In no other way could he account for the subsequent carelessness with which the fisher left the game untouched and lay down to sleep in the first good den. For Pequam, spite of his cunning, has room in his head for only one idea at a time, and so long as you let him keep that idea, you may plan safely to catch him. A curious instant of this came out a few days later, when I took up my abode with the Indian, and went with him to the traps, or wandered alone through the woods, following the crooked trail. Newell had a long line of marten traps, sapel line, he called it, following a ridge for nearly ten miles, crossing the river, and returning on the other side. And down at the lower end was a rough log cabin where we could find shelter if taken by night or a sudden storm. The traps which were scattered at intervals along the ridges were little pens made of stakes or slabs or stones. Inside the pen was a bait of fish or flesh, and over the narrow entrance slanted a weighted log resting on a trigger, so arranged that when an animal entered and seized the bait, the deadfall came down promptly and broke his back. As he visited the traps, Newell frequently carried a drag, a couple of flayed muskrats tied to a string which he dragged along behind him, making a scented trail from one trap to another. Any marten crossing this trail would turn and follow it, and so come straight to one of the traps. One day, a large fisher struck the line and made havoc of it. Pequam either tore the pen to pieces, or else he entered it craftily from the rear and sprung the deadfall harmlessly, and then ate the bait at his leisure. A dozen traps were so destroyed, and one valuable marten, which had been caught, was eaten with the bait. For nearly a month this had continued, hardly a day, but Pequam found the line somewhere, destroying traps and good marten skins until his hunger was satisfied, and craftily avoiding every trap and device that Newell set beside the line to catch him. It was useless to follow his trail, for, except when he is gorged with food and heavy with sleep, one might well try to run down a caribou as to chase a wide-awake fisher with the hope of catching him. At my suggestion, Newell took up five of his large steel traps, which had been set for otter, and we set out one day to outwit Pequam by making him think he understood our devices. At a place in the line, where the big fisher's visits had been most frequent, we took away the triggers from three of the deadfalls in succession, and propped the logs up securely so that they could not fall. The pens were doubled in strength so that even Pequam could not destroy them, and at the entrance of each pen we placed a steel trap covered over with snow. The two outside traps were left sprung and harmless, but the middle one had its jaws open and ready for business, and a fresh drag was made, connecting the three traps and extending out a half a mile on either side. My idea was that Pequam would first find one of the outside traps and poke it about cautiously till he was sure it was harmless, and then go straight to the next one. Farther down the line, we tried another device. In the center of a hollow stump, we stuck a pole with a fresh-killed rabbit swinging at the top. A row of stakes was then driven about the stump, their tops sharpened and pointing outward so that Pequam could not reach the stump except through one entrance in the encircling fence. 
At the entrance we left, a steel trap sprung, and covered it carefully with snow. But in the hollow at the top of the stump was another with its hidden jaws wide open, ready for Pequam when he should come to pull down the pole and carry off his prize. During the night, a light snow fell and covered up every trace of our work. Two days later, there was an interesting story to read in the snow. Pequam had followed the lion till he came to the first steel trap, and instantly he set about understanding the new arrangement. A dozen times he went about the pen, trying every crevice with his nose and eyes. Then he came to the entrance, and very carefully scraped away the snow till the harmless trap was bare. He tried it, cautiously at first, with gentle taps and jabs of his paw, and then more and more roughly, poking and jerking it about at the end of its chain. But no warning snap followed, and nothing happened to hurt him. Whereupon he walked straight over the trap and ate the generous bait that was waiting for him. From here he loped on to the next trap, which was not harmless, and thinking he understood such things, walked straight into it. We found him nearby, with the clog caught fast at the entrance to a den among the rocks. End of section 6《Section 7 of Northern Trails Book 2 》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Melissa Jean. Northern Trails Book 2 by William J. Long. The Trail of the Cunning One, Part 2. Long after I had left the woods, I heard from Newell that he had caught another fisher in the top of the hollow stump. Pequam had poked the unset trap about till he knew it was harmless, and then, just as he went to sleep carelessly after killing the deer, had climbed the stump without any thought, apparently, of another pitfall that might be waiting to receive him. But better than the trapping, and without any regrets, was to wander wide through the woods alone, far away from the sapel line, to follow Pequam's trail, and see what he caught and where he slept, and then at night, before the singing birch logs, to compare notes with Newell, and learn from him the reason for things that I could not understand. Unlike most wild creatures, Pequam does not seem to keep her little ones with her through the winter. A mother deer usually keeps her fawns until the following spring, breaking away for them through the heavy snows, leading them to the best feeding places, guarding them from danger, teaching them from her own example the things which a deer must know. And it is one of the sad things of hunting, that if a doe be killed in the autumn, her fawn will have small chance to live through a severe winter, unless, as is sometimes the case, the fawn joins himself to another doe and follows her about. Even up weakest the lynx often keeps her big, round-eyed, savage young cubs with her, teaching them to hunt and beat the bush together in the long winter when food is scarce. But Pequam, like all the tribe of weasels, which have scant affection for their young, seems to turn her cubs adrift when she has led them about for a little while in the autumn, after which their instincts and quick wits enable them to shift for themselves. In the hungry days, however, the fisher cubs let native cunning take the place of affection. The mother may cast them off, but they know her trail and follow it at a distance whenever they need food. In the early winter, they do very well by themselves, though they know little of the world then and are easily caught in traps. But when the spring comes and small game is scarce, and they are neither skillful nor powerful enough to tackle a deer, then they fall back on skill and generosity of their elders. Sometimes they find their own mother, more often, for Pequam, like Muisuk the coon, has a streak of gentleness in him for his own kind. They take up the trail of the first big fisher they cross, and follow it for days to pick the bones and to eat up anything he might have left of his kill after his own hunger is satisfied. More interesting than these tagging trails of the young fishers are those of the foxes that follow Pequam. Foxes are always hungry, and in the spring, when they are ravenous, and when Pequam takes to killing deer on the crust, Two or three of them will hang to the trail of the big fisher, and live for weeks on the proceeds of his hunting. Pequam rarely covers or hides his kill, but if it be a small one and the territory be not disturbed by men, he will often lie close beside his game in the nearest log, and will rush out from his hiding to drive away the prowlers that would not leave a single bone by morning. Occasionally in the snow you may read the story of his watch and guard, and then a curious thing sometimes comes out. Scarcely he has eaten his full, and yawns sleepily when some prowler comes upon his trail to share the feast. If it be another fisher, Pequam stands aside when he is satisfied, and makes no objection, for the hungry beggar is a young animal, 
and not yet big enough to kill for himself. The older animals are solitary, each hunting over a wide territory, and rarely, except in famine, crossing over to the hunting grounds of any other fisher. But the young have not yet found their own places, and will follow freely where they will. Pequam, if one may believe his tracks, recognizes this, and gives his crumbs ungrudgingly to his hungry kinsmen. When the foxes appear, you read another story. Before Pequam has half finished, they come trotting up on his trail, and squat on their tails in a hungry circle around him. They wrinkle their pointed noses, and lick their chops at the good smell in the air. They open their jaws in a great hungry yawn, showing their red gums and their sharp teeth. They are not beggars, oh no. These gaunt, light-footed bandits, that with the crows and moose birds, follow Pequam as a horde of hungry mouths always follow a shark at sea. Sharers of the feast are they, guests from the byways and hedges, to whom every smell is an invitation. Never a word is said, but one sits behind the master of the feast and makes his jaws crack suggestingly. The others move around and yawn prodigiously in his face, telling him politely to hurry up and eat quickly so that the real feast may begin. The very sight of these hungry, yawning, exasperating fellows rouses Pequam's temper like poking a stick at him. He rushes at the nearest fox to annihilate him, but Elimos turns and floats away lightly through the woods, as if the breeze were blowing him. Try as desperately as he will with his short legs, Pequam can never get any nearer to the white tip of the floating plume before him. And worst of it all, Elimos seems to be making no effort, but looks back over his shoulder as he capers along. Pequam turns back at last, only to hurl himself headlong through the snow, far faster than he came, for the other foxes are already on his kill tearing it away and bolting it in big, hungry mouthfuls. He scatters them like chaff and hunts one away into the swamp, whereupon the first fox slips in and gets a mouthful with the others. Then Pequam comes flying back and sits on his deer and spits impotently at his uninvited guests. He does not chase them again, but eats his fill while the foxes sit around and yawn hugely. With a mouthful now to stay their stomachs, they can wait a little longer. They are never still a minute, but move around, and sit on all sides of the table. When he has eaten enough, Pequam cannot quite make up his mind what to do. He is sleepy already and lies down on the deer, but the old habit of hiding away is strong upon him, and he wants to find a hollow log. He cannot sleep where he is, and if he goes away, the foxes will fall upon his game ravenously and leave him only dry pickings when he comes back again. He backs away craftily at last, and then, when a bush hides him and the foxes are tearing at the game, he rushes back and scatters them like a whirlwind. So the little comedy runs on, and each player writes his own part in the snow for your eyes to read. It always ends the same way. Pequam leaves his game grudgingly and curls up to sleep in his hollow log. But he slumbers uneasily at first, as one does with something on his mind. And before he can sleep contentedly, he must get up once or twice to shivy the foxes which by this time have eaten their full and are carrying away portions to hide in the woods. It is perhaps the thought of these hungry thieves, if even a fox can be called a thief for helping himself when he is hungry, that leads Pequam to leave behind him a curious sign of his ownership. Once I found where he had killed a porcupine and left the greater portion of it uneaten. Instead of covering or hiding his game, he made, at a little distance, a circle of tracks going around his game five or six times and leaving as many plain boundary lines in the snow. My first thought at the time, and I hold it still, was that Pequam was a young fisher and had left a warning to any prowlers that might find his game. When I found it, only a pair of moose birds had disregarded the warning. But I did not know at the time of Pequam's sleepy habit after eating that it may be that he was somewhere near, drowsing away in a hollow log, and had made the cunning circle of tracks to hide his trail and to confuse anyone who should attempt to find him. It is in hunting the porcupine without injury to himself that Pequam's cunning is most manifest. Unkwunk is one of the unanswered questions of the wilderness. So stupid and yet so carefully shielded from the harm and hunger that torments all other animals. He is always fat, while crafty and powerful beasts are starving, and his armor of pointed quills generally shields him perfectly from their attacks. Occasionally the fox or the lynx or the big owl tackles him when hunger becomes intolerable and they must eat or die. But to touch the huge chestnut burr anywhere is to fill one's mouth with quills, 
and behind the burr is the lively tail, always ready to drive in the tormenting barbs by the dozen. Pequam alone has learned the secret of safe attack, and kills the porcupine whenever he is hungry and can find no better meat. Trappers take his skin, but rarely find any deeply embedded quills to tell of these encounters. While the late winter pelts of fox and link often show only too plainly how they have been punished in trying to satisfy their hunger. A curious trail in the snow led me one day to what may be the secret of Pequam's success. He had crossed the clumsy trail of a porcupine and loped along it rapidly, till with a rush he headed Unkwung before the latter could climb a tree and escape the attack. For not even Pequam would dare follow along a branch and expose his face to the blow of Unkwung's tail. The track showed that the porcupine had thrust his forehead promptly against the tree to save his face, according to his wont, and then stood ready, a bristling cushion of spears, defying anything to touch him. Pequam circled swiftly behind his game and plunged into the snow and disappeared. Deep under the deadly tail and the feet and the body of Unklunk, he pushed his tunnel, then thrust his nose out of the snow, just under the porcupine's throat, and gripped him and held fast. A porcupine never struggles when wounded, but holds his thorny guard till he dies. Pequam, lying under the snow with only his muzzle exposed, so that the barbed and swift striking tail could not touch him, simply held his grip on the throat till the tense muscles relaxed their spasmodic pull and lay still. Then he came out, opened his game carefully along the underside, where there are no quills, and ate his fill and went away untouched, leaving the briery, untoothsome morsels to any hungry prowlers that might follow his trail to share the feast. Once since then, a guide told me of following a black cat's trail, and finding where he crept up on a porcupine, and tunneled under him and gripped the throat, while his own body was safe from attack under the snow. And I have no doubt the habit is a more or less common one, and may be witnessed again, if one but will follow patiently Pequam's cunning trail. Where fishers increase, deer grow scarce, for Pequam kills them easily on the crust, and these two facts, the crested deer and the outwitted porcupine, undoubtedly explain why Pequam is often fat, even in the gaunt month of March, and why he sleeps well-fed and warm for days at a time, while larger or faster animals must wander all night, long through the hungry woods. Many other things were seen or read on the trail of the cunning one, while Newell followed his lonely safe line, and the little hunting camp on the Dungarvon, waited with its warm welcome to tired hunters in the twilight. Those were good days, and no hunting ever paid better in happiness than that which followed the trails without a thought of harm, and was content to let the snow tell its own stories. But like all good times, they did not last very long. Work called me away, and I like to think that the solitary old Indian sometimes missed his queer hunting companion, who used to go out for caribou and leave his rifle at home, and who always came back satisfied at nightfall. The door of the little hunting camp now hangs open on its hinges, and within are only mice and squirrels. Newell is far away, following other trails. The birch logs that sang to us the wood's songs are now ashes, and the wind has scattered them to the forest again. But Pequam's coat, still glossy and soft and warm, curls itself into a great muff about a little girl's fingers. The winter wind ruffles it, and it starts and gleams and quivers nervously, as if it heard a footfall on its track. And when you put your face down into it to keep your nose warm, as Pequam used to do when he went to sleep, there is a subtle woodsy fragrance which speaks of fir balsam and birch smoke and the still white woods and of a warm hollow log under the snow at the end of the crooked trail. End of the Trail of the Cunning One End of Section 7《Section 8 of Northern Trails Book 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Melissa Jean. Northern Trails Book 2 by William J. Long. Out of the Deeps, Part 1. The sun was setting gloriously behind the bleak western headlands as her little schooner doubled Goose Cape, nodding a solemn good night with her jib boom to the row of solemn seals on the ice floe, and then headed up slowly into the great silent bay to her night's anchorage. Between us and the unknown waters towered the icebergs, some grounded fast in a hundred fathoms, others drifting majestically in the slow currents, with the long ocean swells racing and breaking over the wide green shelves of ice, and boom-booming their hollow thunder in the deep caverns. 
Like a row of mighty sentinels, they stretched clearer across our course, from the black rocks of Maiden's Arm to the towering cliffs of Bulo Cove, forbidding all entrance to the lonely lands and waters beyond. Every crevice and great hollow on their shining side seemed to be poured full of molten color, while the sunset caught their glittering pinnacles and broke into a glory beyond all words. Hundreds of seabirds, gulls, and penguins, and hagdowns, and unknown fishers of the deep, had settled upon the icebergs and folded the great wings that were weary with the long day's flight. Here they clustered in a dense mass in some great hollow, like a mother's shoulder, talking softly to one another. More often they settled one by one in an endless line upon the topmost shining ridges, where they stood out like delicate ebony carvings against the rugged roof line of the icebergs. In the whole stupendous scene, rock cliffs and ice mountains and boundless sea and burning sky, the eye came back again and again and rested on these tiny dots against the sunset. The ear heard not the crash of falling ice, nor the roar of the smitten sea, nor the hollow boom of breakers in the caverns. It listened for a low chatter, soft as the talk of birds in their sleep, which spoke of life and the gladness of life in the midst of the vast solitude. Behind us, as we watched the scene and the wild duck wore away to find a safe opening between the bergs, the dusk came creeping up over the ocean's brim. In front, a marvellous light of sunset and ice and coloured sea beckoned, yet repelled us by its awful glory. All around us was silence, vast, profound, palpable. A silence of bygone ages, which hushed the sea bird's chatter, and which was only deepened and intensified by the far-off surge of breakers on the shoal and the nearer roll of thunder in the ice caves. Then out of the silence, a groan, an awful sound in the primeval stillness of the place, rumbled over the startled sea. It was as if the abyss itself, silent for untold ages, had at last found a voice, and the voice was a moan of pain. The man at the wheel, a grizzled old fisherman of St. Barb's, who took sublimity and cod traps and storm and sunshine and roaring sea and the sweet rest of snug harbors, all alike in seasoned indifference, whirled sharply and swept the sea with a glance like a needle thrust. Joe the cook tumbled up from the forecastle, his mouth open to take everything in. "'What's that, boy?' he demanded of the skipper with the freedom of Newfoundland fishermen. But the skipper only shook his head and looked seaward whence the sound had come. "'Breakers on Brayhout Shoal,' said the man at the wheel doubtfully at last. "'Air in the ice caves,' echoed Jack. But at the word, the low sound rumbled on our ears again, and we all knew instantly that it came from some living creature. Noel the Indian pointed suddenly to windward, where a hump of water separated itself from the sea and swirled and bubbled like soup in a pot. A huge whale broke the surface. Something flashed beside it, and then another, and the whale was gone. But the awful moan was in our ears again. On the instant all discipline was lost in a great curiosity, as I grabbed the wheel from the grizzled old fisherman, while he and Noel tugged at the main sheet, and the skipper jumped the jibs, and the cook ran for the skipper's glass, and the little wild duck whirled up to the wind and went poking her jib boom at the soapy lather where the whale had disappeared. Now a whale is so big that puny men may be pardoned the supposition that he has no ordinary feelings. All the way up the west coast and through the straits, where we had struggled against tide and gale and fog and ice and the deadly monotony of cramped limbs and close quarters, my friend had amused himself by shooting bullets at the whales that crossed her course, as one would chuck peas at an elephant. Since we could rarely get near enough to study the huge creatures, it was fun to stir them up and watch the sea seethe like a pot when they went down in a hurry. A repeating rifle was usually standing by the foremast, with which we sometimes added a dish to our fare of cod and lobsters, and which served Noel well in bagging a young seal for its oil and skin. As the schooner lay balanced for hours at a time between wind and tide, and we saw with weariness another day without gain and another salmon river unexplored, there'd be a sudden whoosh like the breath of forty locomotives, and a great black back would come plunging up out of the depths. Then the weariness would vanish, and all watched intently as somebody grabbed the rifle and sent the bullet skipping. Invariably, they did no harm at all, but only waked us up, for the huge black back would go on ponderously on its way, rising and sinking, with bullets skipping like hornets athwart its path, and lighting everywhere except on the shining hump. When the magazine was exhausted, Noel would chuckle silently and go to sleep again. The whales were about us continually, in all shapes and sizes, only a few of which were familiar. The rest plunged into soundless deeps, or followed their own endless trails into the fog, like strange steamers, unknown and unnamed. 
Now a shoal of playing dolphins would go rushing, rolling past with a purring roar of smitten water like the low surge of breakers on the beach. While over the mad stampede, single individuals hurled themselves into the air in sheer exuberance of life and animal spirits. Again, a troop of whales of some unknown species would gather silently around the fishing punts, spying and peeking, as inquisitive as so many blue jays. Once a stray right whale, and again an unmeasured monster, a sulfur bottom, I judged, from his enormous length and his high spouting, steamed past like an express train, making the wild duck seem of no size or consequence whatever. Sometimes a dozen of the leviathans would be inside at once. Again, a solitary rorqual would cross our bows ponderously, always alone, yet maintaining apparently a secret communication with others of his kind, scattered over twenty miles of ocean. For though I never saw them approach each other, they always appeared and vanished, turning to east or west altogether, as if a single impulse were leading them. Knowing little about the uncouth creatures, I contented myself with classifying them all, as sailors do, into big ones and little ones, and would watch for hours in the hope of getting near enough to one to observe him closely. Meanwhile, my friend and the sailors were rapidly and harmlessly going through the supply of cartridges. One day, when from an enormous depth a big whale shot his length up out of the sea, and fell back with a resounding splash, and shot the air out of his lungs with a whoosh to waken the seven sleepers, I grabbed the rifle thoughtlessly, having jibbed at the others for their poor shooting, and took a quick crack at the monster before he had fairly settled down to travel. The steel-jacketed bullet caught him fair on the hump, glanced through, and went skipping out exultingly over the sea. Then, so quick that it made one rub his eyes, the huge form had disappeared, and the sea thereabouts looked like a basin of soap spuds. Biss, biss, but that tickled his backbone, cried the skipper. But for me, at least, one problem was solved effectually. The whale has feelings, no doubt about that. And for the rest of the trip, the rifle was kept in the cabin, and we began to watch the huge creatures with a less barbaric interest. End of section 8section 9 of northern trails book 2 this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by melissa jean northern trails book 2 by william j long out of the deeps part 2 another day towards twilight while the schooner loafed along in no hurry whatever to reach an anchorage i was standing at the bow watching the shoals of fish and the circling gulls when a whale broke water and lay resting on the sea close about him were some black rocks breaking the surface as the tide fell and as Leviathan scratched himself leisurely, like a huge sea pig, against the rough surfaces to rid his skin of the clinging barnacles, or lay quiet with his black hump above the water line, he might easily have been mistaken for one of the rocks about which the tide was swirling and ebbing. A big herring gull, heavy and sleepy with too much feeding, came flapping along. As he saw the inviting rock, he set his broad wings and dropped his heavy feet to alight. The toes had barely touched the huge back, when plunge, cuck cuck, there was a lightning swirl and a smother of soapy water. The whale was gone, and a frightened and wide-awake gull was jumping upward, humping his back and threshing the air, and cuck cucking his astonishment at the disappearance of his late landing place. Here were more feelings, delicate enough to feel the touch of a bird's toes on a back so big, that judging by what the whaleman had told me of the whale's insensibility while being lanced, I had supposed its nerves must be arranged about as plentifully as telegraph wires in the country. The whole proceeding was like the lightning jump of a sleeping wolf when a twig cracks or a leaf drops close to his ear. One day, while the schooner lay becalmed, I jumped into the dory with Noel and pulled in shore to see what the herring boats were doing, and to collect some of the queer, unknown fish that were brought up in the nets. As we moved among the boats, I caught sight of a big whale gliding in towards us with all the cautiousness of a coyote approaching a sleeping camp. He would stop here and there and pick up something, and glide forward again to the left or right, like a fox quartering towards a quail roost. As he drew near, I saw that he was after the scattered herring which had fallen from the nets, and which were now floating astern on the surface as the tide drifted them away. Closer and closer he came, while we all stopped our work to watch. The huge bulk would glide softly up to a tiny dot of silver floating on the ocean's blue. The great mouth would open, wide enough to take in a fisherman, and close gently over one small herring. Then he would swallow his tidbit, and back away slowly to watch the boats a while, before picking up another morsel. He always turned sideways so as to look at us with one eye, as a chicken does, 
for he seemed unable to see straight in front of him, but he had other senses to depend upon, and also that unknown feeling of danger when ordinary senses are useless, which the whale men tell us is so strongly developed in this uncouth monster. While he was nosing after two or three herring, I motioned Noel to be quiet, and slipping an oar over the stern, began to scull gently towards him. Hardly had the bow of my dory cleared the line of punts when he sank from sight, and when he came up again he was far away, heading straight out to sea. Farther up the coast, where the straits began to be ice-choked, another curious fact came out, namely that some of these warm-blooded monsters, though they live amid the icebergs, are unwilling to come close to even a small cake of floating ice. The water there is always chilled, and Leviathan avoids it absolutely. More than that, though, he is generally set down as a stupid creature. He showed some small degree of intelligence in taking care of himself. Here, on the west coast, especially under the influence of strong southerly winds, the tide will often set for days in the same direction without turning. Leviathan knows this, though many a skipper loses his vessel in the fog because of his ignorance of the steady eastward set of the tide. At such times, loose ice drifts away and the whales enter many of the narrow bays to feed abundantly on the shoaling fish. But when the tide turns at last, and the ice comes drifting back, the huge creatures leave the bays, fearing to be shut in by a barrier of ice to the whalemen's mercies. And though there be a dozen whales in the bay, as many miles apart, they generally turn all at the same instant, as if at command, and head swiftly out to the open sea and safety. Where the straits grew narrow and the floating ice threatened to block our way altogether, we saw another curious bit of Leviathan's precaution. He would stand straight up on end, appearing like a huge black spile rising ten or fifteen feet above the water, and look far ahead over the nearer ice flows to see if the straits were blocked, and if the survey were unsatisfactory, he would dive deep and come up with a terrific rush, breaching his entire length out of the water, for one swift look far ahead to see whether his course were clear. Still later, when we had at last doubled Cape Bald with its fog and ice and were heading southward, I saw one day a mother whale lying on the sea, suckling her little one. They were resting inshore, close beside our course, and I had an excellent chance to watch them through my glasses ere the mother took alarm and disappeared silently, as a mother moose might have done, leading her ungainly offspring. To my wonder, she did not lie sleepily quiet, as other mothers do. That would have been fatal to the little fellow but kept up a rhythmic rolling from side to side, now dipping the calf deep from sight, now lifting his head above the tops of the waves as he clung to her side, so as to give him free chance to breathe as he fed greedily from his mother's great breast. And as we drew nearer, there was a faint, low mumbling, whether the rare voice of the whale or an audible breathing through the blowholes, or made in some other way, I could not tell, full of a deep, uncouth tenderness as she talked in her own way to her little one, telling the world also that even here in the cold ice-choked wastes of desolation life was good for love was not lacking indeed the tenderness and rare devotion of these huge monsters for their little ones is the most fascinating thing about them here there were feelings of an entirely different sort and now the heart of a man was touched in the thought that there was something in the huge creatures of our sport that was after all akin to ourselves at first our interests had been largely barbaric to stir up leviathan with the fear of man and see how quickly like the oily flash of a dolphin he could make his bulk disappear the scientific stage followed in in which we spoke of unclassified varieties hoping to make a discovery and babbled of dentiseat the presence of teeth being more important than habits of life and balinidae and fistoridae especially physeter macrocephalus and orcanus gladiator in six varieties "'What's that?' demanded the grizzled old fisherman, who could stand it no longer. "'That's a killer whale,' I told him. "'Oh,' he said, "'should think twould kill you to remember it.' So he gave up trying to name these monsters of the abyss, with names sufficiently uncouth to be scientific, and brought back the crew to life by lowering a boat to see what kind of squid or fish or tiny mollusk they were eating. For we had been told that in certain species the throat of one of these huge whales is so small that a pippin would choke him. Soon the sporting interest awoke. One who knew the whalemen well talked of harpoons and ambergris, and told the story of the Nantucket ship that had been charged and battered and sunk by a fighting old bull, whereupon the grizzled fisherman of St. Barb's pulled in with an account of what he had seen last summer, when a whale blundered into the fisherman's nets during a storm. Three days he lay in the trap, now pushing his head into a net, and drawing back in a fright at the queer thing 
now breaching clear of the water to see if there was any way out, and falling back heavily again, as if discouraged in his quest. Then he evidently made up what he would call his mind, and the whole fleet of boats stood by and cursed impotently, while the hopes of a dozen families went whirling blindly out to sea on the flukes of a bewildered wark wall. But these stages were past, and our interest was purely human, as we stood now in a close group at the weather rail of the schooner, scholar and fisherman alike, to learn what hidden grief or pain had added a new voice to the world of waters. The whale rolled up again, nearer this time. There was a wriggle and a flash beside him. A long, snaky body leaped clear of the water, doubling itself like a steel spring, and struck down a terrific blow at the whale's head. Thresher, cried the skipper excitedly. The creature leaped and struck again, and a heavy thud rolled over the ocean, like the blow of a giant flail. Before I could see plainly all that happened, Something struck the whale from below, and he rolled under in a smother of foam, while the ocean itself seemed to bellow forth its rage and pain. But whether the strange sound were indeed the rare voice of the whale, or the reverberation of smitten water, or the vibration of great volumes of air driven out of the laboring lungs through the blow holes, we could not tell, nor had the fisherman ever heard it save when a whale was fighting for his life. While the whale was gone, and we watched breathless for him to come again to the surface, the skipper and the old fisherman answered my hurried questions. Yes, they had seen the threshers, or fox sharks, before, and had sometimes caught them in their nets. Once they had seen three or four of them fighting a whale as they were jigging cod on the shoal. They were from twelve to twenty feet long, the skipper said, including the prolonged upper lobe of the tail, which they could use with a terrific force as a weapon of offense. Then the scholar brought out of the cabin the skull of a fox shark, that we had found in the hut of a Labrador fisherman, a skull that was chiefly a pair of long, pointed, cruel jaws with rows of hooked ivory fangs fitting together like the teeth of a bear trap. "'That's it, a thresher,' said the skipper. "'He'll gouge them jaws into a whale or porpoise with a twist of his tail and rip out a bite that would fill a bucket. There he is!' The whale shot out of the depths and breached clear in the water of his upward rush. As he fell back, there was the same flash and wriggle beside him, the same leap as of a bent spring, the same heavy blow and moan. Then something else appeared, darting up like a ray of light, and the long blade of a swordfish ripped through the whale's side. The force of his attack brought the big fish to the surface, where we saw his shoulders plainly, and caught the flash of light on his terrible weapon as he turned to dive beneath his victim. The whale sounded again, turning fair on end, with the thresher leaping over him, or standing on his head to strike down a last terrible blow, as the huge victim sought blindly for an abyss deep enough to escape the lash and sting of his enemies. The schooner fell away in the light evening wind, and the rush of the uncouth tragedy carried it swiftly away where no man watched the end of it. But this much seemed clear. The two strangely assorted bandits, savage monsters of the savage sea, were working together to destroy their great and helpless victim, the thresher lashing him down to the swordfish with flail-like blows of his flukes, and the swordfish driving him up on the point of his lance to the thresher again. What started the fight, or how it ended, no man can say. Here and there, between the ship and the rim of dusk, there would be a sudden turmoil, a flash and a whirl of foam. As the turmoil sank, a low moan shivered on the sea. So they passed out into the deeps and were gone. End of section 9, end of Out of the Deeps Section 10 of Northern Trails, Book 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Melissa Jean. Northern Trails, Book 2, by William J. Long. Matwalk of the Icebergs. Matwalk, the huge polar bear, drifted down from the Arctic on an iceberg and landed one spring night in the fog at Little Harbor Home on the East Newfoundland coast. It seemed at first a colossal fatality, that iceberg. The fishermen had just brought their families back from the winter lodge in the woods and had made their boats ready to go out to the hook and line grounds for a few fresh cod to keep themselves alive. Then a heavy fog shut in, and in the midst of the fog, the iceberg came blundering into the tickle, as if there were no other place in a thousand leagues of sea and rock-bound coast. There were two hundred fathoms of water at the harbour mouth, and the great berg touched bottom softly, yet with a terrific impact, which sent huge masses of ice crashing down on the black rocks on either side. It might stay a month, or it might drift away on the next tide. Meanwhile, the fishermen were helpless as flies in a bottle. 
for the iceberg corked in the harbor mouth, and not even a punt could get in or out. Old Toma came that same day from his hunting camp far away in the interior. Grown tired of eating beaver meat and smoking willow bark, he had brought some otter skins to trade for a little pork and tobacco, with a few warm stockings thrown in for good measure. But the trading schooner, for which the islanders watch in spring, as a lost man watches for morning, had not yet come, and the fishermen themselves were at the point of starvation. For a month they had tasted nothing but a little dried fish and dough balls. Hunting was out of the question, for their dogs were all dead, and their few guns were out with the young men, who before the advent of the iceberg had taken their lives in their hands and gone up the coast, sealing in a stout little schooner. So Toma, taking his otter skins, started back for his own camp. As his custom was in a strange place, Toma first climbed the highest hill in the neighborhood to get his bearings. The blundering iceberg seemed to him a grim joke, more grim than the joke on himself which had left him a forty-mile tramp without pork or tobacco or warm stockings. He was watching the berg with silent Indian intenseness when a mass of overhanging ice crashed down on the rocks. Something stirred, and a deep cave suddenly laid open. The next instant, his keen eyes made out a figure of a huge white bear standing in the cave, rocking his head up and down as the smell of the village drifted out of the harbor and into his hungry nostrils. Toma came down from the hill to leave a warning at the little store. Best look out, he said. Bear over there on that ice. Big, whole oh big one. He come here tonight, soon's dark, see what he can find. He hungry and oh cross, don't fraid nothing. Best set him trap, catch him, plenty meat. Then, because he had left his own gun behind, and could borrow none in the village, he started inland on his long tramp. Matwak the bear landed from his iceberg as soon as it was dark, as Toma had said, and headed straight for the village. For a month he had been adrift in the open sea without food, because the seals which had first enticed him away till fifty miles of open water stretched between him and his native haunts had now returned to the coast to rear their young on the rocks and grounded ice floes. Meanwhile, the great berg to which he clung as a mariner to a floating spar drifted steadily southward over the mist-shrouded ocean with its base a thousand feet deep in a powerful current. Most of the time he had slept, going back to the old bear habit of hibernation to save his strength. But when the berg grounded and the wind from the harbor brought the smell of fish and of living animals to his nostrils, he sprang up ravenously hungry. Never having seen men, he had no fear. Straight and swift he followed his nose, ready to seize the first food, living or dead, that lay in his path. On the outskirts of the village he came upon a huge deadfall, which the men had made hurriedly at Toma's suggestion, partly to get meat, of which they were in sore need, but more to protect themselves and their little ones from the savage prowler which knew no fear. The bait was a lot of offal, bones and fish skins tied together with codline and the fall log was the stump of a big mast, waterlogged and heavy as lead, which had come ashore a few years ago from a wreck, and which they made heavier still by rocks lashed on with cables. Matlock entered the pen swiftly, grabbed the bait, and thud, down came the weighted log on his shoulders. Now a black bear would have been caught across the small of his back, and his spine cracked like an eggshell by the fearful blow. But Matlock was altogether too big, and the pen altogether too small. With a roar of rage, he hurled the log aside, smashed the pen into fragments, and charged straight through the village, knocking to pieces with blows of his terrible paws the pens and fish flakes that stood across his path. More than one man jumped from his bed at the uproar to see the huge white brute rush past, and to bless himself that he was safe within doors. Matwalk went back to his cave in the iceberg, angry and sore, yet with a strange timidity at heart from this first experience in the abodes of men. What the abominable thing was that had fallen on his back, he had, of course, no idea. But he had learned in a minute that he could not prowl here with the power and authority that marked him in the vast snowy solitudes where no man dwells. He was licking a wound that a chain had torn in his shaggy white coat, when a faint scratching and grunting amid the ceaseless roar of breakers and booming waves in the ice caverns came to his sensitive ears and made him steal out instantly to investigate. Down on a shelf of ice, on the seaward side of the great berg, two bull seals had floundered out, fat and heavy with food, to sleep and bask in the sun, which was just then rising. A glance told the bear that the big seals had chosen the spot well, where no danger could approach save from the open sea, out of which they had just come. Of the berg itself they had no fear whatever, for it rose behind them a hundred feet in a sharp incline, to where a score of glistening spires and minarets began, on which the seabirds were resting. 
So they stretched their fat bulks comfortably on the narrow shelf of ice, watching the open sea, blinking sleepily in the sunshine. Slowly, cautiously, Matwok circled the berg, creeping upward along the great crevice to reach another shelf over the basking seals. His great feet were padded thickly with fur, which clung to the ice like wool, and where the ascent was most ticklish, the muscles of his forelegs contracted strongly, driving his claws like steel hooks into the ice. So he gained the high shelf at last, and lay down, with only his ears and eyes showing over the edge, as he looked down hungrily at his game. Below him was a dizzy incline, steep as a mountain top, polished and glistening with the frost and storms of the centuries, at the foot of which the unconscious seals were basking. Very deliberately, Matwok chose his position over the larger seal. Then, with his hind legs, he pushed himself steadily over the edge, crouching low on his belly with his nose and his forepaws, which were stretched straight out in front of him. Like a flash of light, he glanced down over the slope, striking the seal a terrific blow, and knocking him end over end as the bear shot him into the sea. There was a terrible commotion for an instant, which set the sea birds flapping and clamoring wildly. Then out of the turmoil, Matwok's head arose, gripping the big seal by the neck. He laid his game carefully on the ice shelf, kicked himself up after it, and ate it there, where a moment before it had been blinking sleepily in the morning sun. The presence of his favorite game in the strange land turned Matwok's thoughts from the village of men into which he had blundered with the iceberg. No boats came out or in to disturb him, so he kept his abode in the ice cavern, which was safe and warm, and out of which he wandered daily up and down the rocky coast. A few mother seals had their young here, hidden on the great ice floes which were fast anchored to the rocks and shoals. The little seals are snow-white at first, for kind nature forgets none of her helpless children the better to hide on the white ice on which they are born. Only their eyes and the tips of their noses are black, and at the first alarm they close their eyes and lie very still, so that it is almost impossible to see them. Even when you stand over them, they look like rough lumps of snow ice. If they have time, they even hide the black tips of their noses in their white fur coats, and if you appear suddenly, they simply close their eyes, and the black nose tip looks like a stray pebble or a tiny bit of bark left by the uneasy winds that sweep over the ice floes. As they grow larger and begin to fish for themselves, they gradually turn dark and sleek like their mothers, the better to slip unseen through the dark waters in which they hunt. Like all bears, Matwok had poor eyes and depended chiefly on his nose in scouting. He would swim swiftly, mile after mile, along the edges of the floes, raising his head to sniff every breeze, trying to locate where the young seals were hiding. But the little ones give out almost no scent at such times, besides being invisible, and Matwok rarely dined on a nest of young seals. The only way he could catch them was by a cunning bit of bear strategy. He would swim far out from the edges of the floes and drift about among the floating ice, looking himself like an ice cake or else he would crouch on an ice field and watch for hours till he saw a big seal clamber out and knew from her actions that she was feeding her young. Then he would head straight and swift for the spot and nose it all over till he found what he was seeking. When the big bull seals came ashore to bask in the sun, resting on a rock or the edge of an ice floe once they could slip instantly into deep water, Matlock invented a new style of still hunting. He would slip silently far down to leeward, for the seal's nose is almost as keen as his own and there begin his cautious stalk upwind, sinking his enormous weight deep in the water till only his nose and the top of his head appeared. He would glide slowly along the edge of the floe, looking exactly like a bit of loose ice drifting along the tide. When near the game, he would disappear entirely, and, like an otter, not a ripple marked the spot where he went down. The big seal would be blinking sleepily on the edge of the ice floe, raising himself on his flippers to stretch like a wolf, or turning leisurely to warm both sides at the sun when the huge head and shoulders of a bear would shoot up out of the water directly in front of him. One swift, crushing blow of the terrible paw, and the seal would be dead without a thought of what had happened to him. So Matwok lived and hunted for a week, growing fat and contented again. Then the seals vanished on one of their sudden migrations, following fish, no doubt, and for a week more he hunted without a mouthful. One night, when he returned late to his cave, the great iceberg had broken its anchorage and drifted well out of the tickle, and from the harbour the smell of fresh fish drifted into his hungry nostrils. For the day had been sunny and calm, and the starving fishermen had slipped out to the hook and line grounds, and brought back exultingly the first cod of the season. Again, Matlock came ashore, tired as he was after an all-day's swim, and headed straight for the good smell in the village. The big deadfall was set in his path, baited with fresh offal, 
and the log was weighted twice as heavily as before. But the bear had learned cunning, and entered the trap from the rear, tearing the heavy pen to pieces as if it were made of straws. The fall came down again with a thud that made the ground shiver, but it fell harmlessly on the bed log, and Matwok ate the bait greedily to the last scrap. Then he entered the village, rummaging the wharves and sheds boldly, and leaving his great footprints at every door. When he had eaten everything in sight, he headed down the long arm of the harbour, drawn still by the smell of fish that floated up in the night air. Later that night, old Toma appeared with his otter skins and a haunch of caribou at Daddy Crummit's cabin, on the edge of the woods far down at the bottom of Long Arm. All winter, Daddy Crummit had been sick, chiefly from rheumatism and lack of food, and Toma, taking pity on the lonely old man, blundered around in the dark to find wood to make a stew of the savory meat which he had brought with him all the way from his camp in the interior. At twilight, a fisherman, kind-hearted and generous as they all are, had come to leave a couple of fresh cod and hurry away again on his long, weary pull up the arm. Daddy meant to cook the fish, but he was too weak when the time came, and left them in a barrel in his little shed. Then came Tomo with his stew, and the old man ate and felt better. It was midnight when they had smoked a pipe of Tomo's dried willow bark and traded the scant news from the two ends of the wilderness and turned in to sleep. A terrible racket in the shed roused them. Whack, bang, thump. Something was out there knocking everything to pieces. Daddy, under the bedclothes, began to shiver and wail that the devil himself had come to fetch him. Toma tumbled out of his caribou skins and jumped up like a jack-in-a-box, just as a barrel was flung against the door with a crash that made it shiver. In the appalling silence that followed, they heard the pachap, pachap of some huge beast crunching the codfish between his jaws. Toma had brought his gun this time. He grabbed it from behind the stove, pulled the big hammer back, and felt with his fingers to be sure that the cap was ready on the nipple. He stole to the door and opened it cautiously, pushing the gun barrel out ahead of him. A huge white beast turned swiftly as the door squeaked. Toma, making out what seemed to him a great head in the darkness, poked the muzzle of the gun into it and pulled the trigger. There was a deafening roar. The door was slammed back in the face of the old Indian, with a force that sent him sprawling on his back. Daddy, with a last terrible groan, lay still, as if it were all over. When Toma scrambled to his feet, his ears ringing, his nose filled with pungent powder smoke, there lay Matwok at the end of his long trail. He was lying as if asleep, his great paws outspread across the threshold, his head resting heavily between them. The tail of the last codfish stuck out of the corner of his mouth, and his lips were parted in a ferocious grin, as if to the end it were all a huge joke. Pie kosh, said Toma, rubbing his scalp and looking down in a puzzled way at the great beast. Why I go logum dat caribou forty mile, huh? Plenty me here, all plenty, he added as he dragged the great head aside and shut the door and rolled up in his caribou skins for another nap. End of section 10section 11 of northern trails book 2 this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by melissa jean northern trails book 2 by william j long part 1 of where the salmon jump a glorious salmon river unnamed but not unknown to the few newfoundland fishermen who have explored the rugged east coast comes singing and shouting down through the woods and leaps hilariously over copswagen the jumping place below the falls the river roars and tumbles among the great rocks spreads a little into numerous channels of rushing white water, gathers again into a strong, even, rippling current, full of crinkly yellow lights, rolls through a huge pool sedately, and then goes shouting down the rapids to another fall. Birds are singing to the swelling buds, the wind rustles among the new leaves and hums steadily in the spruce tops, the air quivers to the rhythmic throbbing of the falls, a deep organ peal rolls up from the rapids. But all these sounds and subtle harmonies are but beats of the sleeping woods, for listen, over all broods the unbroken silence of the wilderness. Just below the falls, where the torrent spreads into hurrying white channels, a man with a salmon rod is standing on a flat rock that juts into the current. All the bright sunny morning he has been standing there, his ears full of bird and river music, his eyes full of the rushing foam and sunlight of the river, his heart brimful of all that is good in the wilderness. A couple of salmon, little nine-pounders, lie on a shaded mossy bank, where Noel sits smoking his pipe. Now and then the Indian quietly advises trying a pool lower down, and the advice is good, because the river is full of salmon, and down below, where they have not seen the fly, they will come up 
with a rush at anything. Here they have already grown shy from seeing the little jock Scott sweeping over the foam, followed by the terrific rushes of two captured salmon and of three more that broke away gloriously. But it is only a small part of fishing to catch fish, and the man finds it perfect where he is, thinking it better fun to locate one good salmon and entice him to rise, rather than go below and catch or lose a dozen. So he stands quietly on the jutting rock, watching the river, listening to the music. So long has he stood there, following the swing and jump of his little fly in the boiling current, that the rushing movement has got into his eyes, producing a curious illusion that every salmon fisher will recognize. Not only the river, but the shores themselves seem sweeping along to keep pace with the hurrying flood. The big log that bridges the stream below the falls is running swiftly away, and after it come the white sheet and thunder of the waterfall trying to catch it. The green banks and bushes scud away like clouds before the wind. Even the great solid rock underfoot joins the swift, unsteady procession, and down we all go, trees, rocks, and river, swaying, jumping, singing, and shouting together on a glorious chase through the wilderness. In the midst of the rush and tumult, the clear, sweet song of Killulit, the white-throated sparrow, follows us, as if he were saying, Goodbye, friend fisherman, fisherman, fisherman. In spite of all the apparent uproar of rocks and river, the exquisite little melody sounds in our ears as clearly as if Killulit were singing behind our tent in the twilight stillness. The man's head grows dizzy with the delusion. His foothold at best is none too steady over the rushing torrent. So he closes his eyes to bring back the reality of things. And the reality must be good indeed, judging by the way his soul, like a wind-touching harp, is thrilling to the melody of woods and waters. As he opens his eyes again, there is a sudden plunge on the edge of the farthest white rush of water. A huge salmon tumbles into sight, showing head and shoulders and a foot of broad blue back, that makes the man's nine-pounders look like smelts in a cod trap. Dust a feller, big o' oh, big one, says Noel, straightening his back, and instantly the slender rod gets into action. The fly falls softly across the current, swings down with the flood, and fetches up beautifully at the end of a straight leader, just over the spot where the water humped itself as the big salmon went down. Like a flash, he boils up at the lure, throwing his big shoulders out of the foam in his rush but the fly swings nearer and hangs skittering on the surface. Miss him dat time, says Noel with immense disappointment, and the man draws in his line and sits down on the rock to let the big salmon settle into his sunken eddy and forget what he saw when his head came out of the water. While we are waiting for him to grow quiet, resting him, the salmon fishermen call it, let us find out if we can what he is doing here and why he halts so long in the midst of all this turmoil while his instincts are calling him steadily up the river to the quiet shallows where his life began. First look down into the water, there at your feet, where the river is running swiftly but smoothly over the yellow pebbles near shore. Nothing but smiles, dimples, and crinkly yellow lights, whirling and changing ceaselessly, as if the river here were full of liquid sunshine. Look again, curve a hand on either side of your eyes to shut out the side lights, and look steadily just below that round yellow stone under its three feet of crinkly sunshine. At first you see nothing, your eyes being full of the flashing surfaces and the dimpling lights and shadows of the yellow flood. Suddenly, as if a window were opened in the river, you see a vague, quivering outline. Did he just come? Is he gone again? Not at all, he is right there. Look again. Another long look, again the impression of a window opened, and now you see a salmon plainly. He's lying there, with his nose in a sunken eddy, resting quietly while the river rolls on over him. You see his shining silver sides, the blue tint on his back, the black line of a net on his head, the tail swaying rhythmically, every line of the splendid fish as in a clear photograph. Then, as if the window were suddenly shut, you see nothing but dancing yellow lights. The fish has vanished utterly, and you must look again and again, waiting till the lights and dimples run away together, and there is your salmon, lying just where he was before, nor has he moved except for the lazy swaying of his broad tail and the balancing of his fins, while the lights above hid him from your eyes. When looking for salmon, as with other good things in life, the eye is easily confused by a multitude of little unimportant things close at hand. Standing on the same rock, Noel will point out a score of salmon where you see nothing because changing lights and dimples. It is not because his eyes are stronger or keener than yours, for they would fail in a week if they had your work to do, 
but simply because he has learned to look through the intermediate superficialities for the better thing that he is seeking. Where your eye sees only ripples and flashes, his eye disregards these things and finds the big salmon lying just below them. Climb into the tree there, the big spruce leaning out over the water. Now the surface lights have lost their power over your eyes, and you can see clearly to the river's bed. There, close beside the one salmon that you glimpsed for a moment, a dozen more are lying. Above and below they sprinkle the river, each one lying with his nose behind a stone, and catching the current's force on his fins, in such a way that the flood, which would sweep him away, is made to hold him in position without conscious effort, just as a seagull soars against the wind. Look out now at the white rush where the big salmon just plunged at my fly. He is not there, and you wonder if the shining leader or the sight of the swaying rod has scared him away. Now let your eye follow the current a little way. There, ten feet below, where the foam ceases, a monster salmon is lying behind a stone under a smooth run of water. As you look, he darts forward like a ray of light, and you lose him for an instant. Then he plunges out just where you saw his first great rise. In a moment, he sweeps back again and rounds up into his own eddy, lightly, gracefully, as a sloop rounds up to her mooring. There is something in his mouth, a leaf, perhaps, or a big black and yellow butterfly, but the next moment he shoots it out, as one would blow a cloud of smoke. The current seizes it, crumples it, and sends it down, spreading and quivering like a living thing into the next eddy. Instantly, another salmon flashes into sight, catches the leaf with a whirl and plunge, holds it in his mouth a moment, and then blows it out again. That's what they are doing, just playing with pretty little things that come skipping and dancing down the river, as your fly came at the end of its invisible leader. Half an hour ago, they were asleep, or utterly indifferent to all your flies and delicate casting. Now the queer mood is on them again, and they will take anything you offer. But wait a moment, here comes a fish hawk. Ismax, on set wings, comes sailing gently down the river. He shears off with a sharp chwee, and circles twice as he notices us in the treetop. But in a moment he is scanning the water again. From his height, his keen eyes see every fish in the river, but they are all too large and too deep under the swift water. Later, when the run of grill sea comes in, he will be able to pick up a careless one, but now he just looks over the river, as if it were his own preserve, and circles back to the lake where his nest is. When he brings his little ones down here to fish, you will see them at first whirling low over the water, all excitement at seeing so many big salmon for the first time. But the ripples and the dancing lights bother their eyes, just as they do yours. And then you will hear Ismax whistling them up higher where they can see better. End of section 11. Section 12 of Northern Trails Book 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Melissa Jean. Northern Trails Book 2 by William J. Long. Part 2 of Where the Salmon Jump. As we stand on the rock once more, and the fly goes sweeping down the current, there is the same swift rush of our big salmon in the same spot, and another miss. He is rising short, that is, behind the fly, which shows that he is a bit suspicious and that our lure is too large. As we change it leisurely for a smaller one of the same kind, the heavy plunge of a fish draws your attention upstream, where a salmon is jumping repeatedly high out of water just below the falls. What is he jumping there for? You will laugh when I tell you that he is trying to get a good look at the falls. But that is true, nevertheless. Come up to the fallen spruce that bridges the river, and let us watch him there for a while. Our big salmon will keep. He is in a rising mood, and when we get him, fishing is over for the day, for we have enough. Below the falls, which are here some ten or twelve feet high, salmon are jumping continually. As you watch the heavy white rush of water, other salmon poke their heads out of the foam, look at the falls a moment, and disappear. Then a silver gleam flashes through some black water. A salmon springs out, flies in a great arc up to the rim of the falls, just touches the falling sheet of water, plunges over the brim, and disappears with a victorious flash of his broad tail into the swift water above. He has done it, jumped the falls, and though the whole thing was swift as light, you have the impression that at last you know just how it was done. Down yonder there are some lower falls, and there you can see the salmon leaping clear over them in a single spring rising out of the foam below and disappearing into the swift, clear stream above, without even touching the falling sheet of water. But here it is different. Salmon after salmon springs out, lands on his tail against the falling water just below the brim of the falls, 
and then plunges up and over as his tail, like a bent spring, recoils from under him. Now throw a stone or two into the falls, just where that last salmon struck. There, I hit you with a big one, and in a flash you see and hear that the sheet of falling water is thinnest there, and that the face of the rock lies close beneath. Here is a suggestion which may explain why and how the salmon jump. Down on the still reaches of the river where they jump continually, especially in the late afternoon. That is partly for fun and play, no doubt, but it is also for practice to accustom themselves to high jumps and to learn how to land on head or tail as they please. Here under the falls they jump out of water and again hold their heads above the foam as you see them to study the place and to see where they must strike in order to succeed. There to the left is a spot where the falls are a foot lower than the average, but though you watch all day you will not see a single salmon jump there, where you would naturally expect him to try. The river pours swiftly through this notch, worn in the softer rock, and spurts farther out from the face of the wall beneath. Were a salmon to strike there, he would find no solid purchase from which to finish his leap, but would be overwhelmed in a flash by the force of the cataract. To the right of this notch are two places which seem to be favourites with the salmon. Again and again, in days of watching, you will see them land on their bent tails in these two spots. As they land, their tails strike down through the falling water, touch the rock beneath, and recoil like steel springs and the salmon bound up like rubber balls and vanish over the brim. Occasionally they fall, and you have a confused impression of a big silver fish hurled into the turmoil below. Look, there in the shallow eddy, beside that rock on the shore, there is a fat eighteen-pound salmon struggling to hold his place. The cruel gash in his side shows all too plainly that he failed in his jump and was hurled back upon the rocks. To stay here now is death to Copsey. For even should he escape, the bear and otter and eagle, a multitude of parasites, plant and animal, would fasten upon the wound and suck his life away. That is what his slime is for, to oil his silver sides and keep away these deadly fungi that swarm in fresh water. Once the scales are scraped away and the tender flesh laid bare, Copsip has no protection, and to stay in the river is suicide. But even here nature is not unkind, nor does she ever forget a creature's needs. Other salmon eat nothing while they are moving up the rivers to their spawning beds, and appetite itself vanishes. But the wounded fish there suddenly feels within him the need of recuperation, and takes to feeding greedily upon whatever the river brings him. Toss in a worm, a bit of meat, a fly, anything edible, and he rises to it swiftly. In a few hours he feels better, and whirls in the current, and goes speeding back to the sea, where the salt water destroys the parasites, and heals his wound, and makes him strong again but he will not come back to the river again this year. A half a mile above, there is another fall, higher than this one. Let us go up and find there the most difficult problem of all to answer. A single glance at the falls tells you instantly that they are too high for any salmon to leap. Other rivers with a fall no higher than this one are barred to the salmon, which run up only as far as the falls and then turn back to the sea, or else spawn at the mouths of shallow brooks along the way. But the salmon in this river go clear to the headwaters, you can see them jumping and catch a dozen above the falls. Here, just below the cataract, they are springing high out of water or poking their heads out of the foam, just as they did at the lower falls, in order to study the difficult place. As you watch, a big salmon flashes up in a great arc and tumbles into the sheet of falling water, not halfway up to the top. Soon another follows him, striking in the same place. You watch closely but see nothing more. They have simply vanished into the falls. A dead salmon floats past you, Another is gasping in a shallow eddy. A third lies half-eaten by an otter under the shelving bank. Here is a place, evidently, where many fail. Now watch the topmost rim of the waterfall. Ten minutes pass slowly while you keep your eyes on the line where the yellow flood breaks over the brim of the falls. There, a flash of living silver breaks the uneven line. A broad tail cuts the air in a curving sweep as a salmon plunges safely over the top into the swift water above. That is probably the fish you saw vanish into the falls, ten feet below. Now we must follow him if we are to learn anything more of his methods. For twenty years, ever since I first finished the Savagol, I have wondered how it is possible for salmon to get up a waterfall, which was plainly impossible to leap. And on reading the books, I found that almost every salmon fisherman for two centuries had puzzled over the same problem. Standing under these falls, one day, and throwing stones at the spots in the falling sheet of water where the salmon were plunging in, it occurred to me suddenly that it might be possible to go in myself and find out what they were doing. On two rivers I had tried it unsuccessfully, and though I had glimpses of salmon lying on the wet rocks inside the falls, I was almost swept away in the cataract. 
Here the task proved unexpectedly easy, for on one side the swift flood shot far out from the face of the rock, and the falling sheet of water was not heavy enough to knock one off his feet. So if you don't mind a soaking, which will do you no harm here in the deep wilderness, where there are no microbes to give you a cold, let us after our salmon. With rubber coats falling down over waders, we slip through and under the edge of the broad sheet of falling water, and stand close against the rocky wall. It is cool and wet here. The hollows in this rough face of rock are brimming over. The air is full of heavy mist, but the flood pours over our heads without touching us. A salmon is kicking violently among the stones, and you brush him with your foot out into the cataract. As we move along to the middle of the stream, pressing close against the wall, with the thunder of the falls pouring over us harmlessly, we come suddenly upon salmon everywhere, on the stones, in deep hollows of the rock, struggling up the scarred and pitted face of the cliff itself. Push on a little farther, and now you will see a great crevice slanting diagonally up the wall, almost to the brim of the fall over your head. A thin stream of water runs through it, making a fall within a fall. This crevice is full of salmon, some dead, some lying and resting quietly in the hollows, others kicking, flapping, sliding upward over the wet stone and the slippery bodies of their fellows to the life above. Your first visit may solve the problem, for this river at least, or you may have to return again and again before you see the thing accomplished from beginning to end. This is the time for the river is just beginning to rise after the rains, and great runs of salmon are moving up from the pools below, while those that were here, resting below the falls for the great effort, feel the onward movement, and start upward to the spawning grounds at the head of the river. As you stand here, salmon after salmon comes flying in through the falling sheet of white water. Some strike fair against the wall, rebound, and are swept away like smoke. Others, as if they knew the spot, plunge into a wet hollow, rest for an instant from the shock, then wriggle and leap to the hollows above. Here is one that dashes in and lights fairly in the great crevice at your shoulder. On the bodies of three or four other salmon that are lying there gasping and struggling feebly in an instant his broad tail is threshing violently pushing him upward in desperate flappings and wrigglings up over the rock over the bodies of his fellows resting here leaping bodily there over a ridge up and up till with one last effort he plunges over the brim and is gone however it may be on other rivers the problem here is an amazingly simple one the salmon leap into the falls, trusting to luck or instinct, or more probably to knowledge gained from previous experience, to break through the sheet of falling water and land in one of the numerous hollows or crevices in the face of the rock. Then, if not stunned or swept away in the first effort, they struggle up the side of the rock itself, and over the bodies of their less successful fellows, till near enough to the top to leap over. Here, as indeed in most falls, one may notice a curious rhythmic movement of the water, it rarely pours over the falls in an even flood, but rather in a succession of spurts, with slower and lighter movements between, so that both by eye and ear one gets the impression of the throbbing in the water's movements, as if the river were only one of many arteries, and somewhere behind them at all a great heart were beating and driving the waters onward, in slow, regular, mighty pulsations. Undoubtedly the salmon make use of this fact, resting near the top of the rock for a slower and lighter movement of the water, when they throw themselves over the brim of the fall, and so avoid being swept away after accomplishing the most difficult and dangerous part of their journey. Desperate as it is, this is probably the method used on other rivers where salmon surmount a waterfall which is plainly too high to leap. Dr. Elwood Worcester of Boston writes me that while salmon fishing on White Bay, his guides told him of a place where the salmon climbed the cliff behind a fall, and where the fishermen collected barrels of fish for winter every season. He went with them behind the fall and watched for hours as the salmon plunged in and then began the almost impossible task of leaping up the rock. There, as here, only a fraction of the struggling fish ever reached the top. Some of the unsuccessful ones tried again. Others sped away to heal their wounds. The rest lay quiet among the rocks, awaiting the poor fishermen, or floated away to feed the mink and the eagle. Nature called the many in order to choose a few and the whole process was accompanied by that apparent waste and perfect economy with which nature always accomplishes her object. As we go downstream and take up our position on the flat rock again, a heavy plunge is out on the edge of the white current, shows that our big salmon is still there and in a rising mood. He will take our fly now, and the rest is a matter of skill, with a large element of luck, which is all in the salmon's favour. 
but our glimpse under the falls has aroused a new interest in the hidden life of the big fish, resting and playing there in the turmoil. So let us hear his story before we catch him. End of Where the Salmon Jump End of Section 12《Section 13 of Northern Trails, Book 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Melissa Jean. Northern Trails, Book 2 by William J. Long. The Story of Copseep, Part 1. One late autumn, a few years ago, a big salmon came up to the headwaters of the river and sought out a place for herself where she might hide her eggs. All summer long she had journeyed slowly up the river, resting below the falls in rapids to gather her strength and choosing the bright, moonlit nights to hurry up through the riffles, where Mooween the bear was waiting to catch her as she passed. Now, with most of the danger and all of the effort behind her, she came straight to the shallows at the mouth of a cold brook, where the bottom was covered with sand and yellow pebbles. Where the current rippled evenly over its bed of golden gravel, she found the place she was seeking, and, like fishhawks returning in the spring, her first care was to repair the nest that had been used for centuries by other salmon. Her broad tail fanned away the coating of mud that had settled over the petals, and the current swept it away downstream. Bits of rotten wood and twigs and leaves that had jammed among the stones she took up with her mouth and carried to one side, leaving the rest all white and clean. As she worked, a great male fish, with a kipper hook on its lower jaw, came surging up and chose her for his mate, and then began circling about her, fighting the other salmon and chasing away the trout that swarmed hungrily about waiting for the feast of salmon eggs that was to follow. When the nest was at last ready, the big male fish came and ploughed long furrows through it with the beak that had been growing on the point of his lower jaw for this purpose ever since he entered fresh water. These furrows were fanned clean with tails and fins, and then his mate, settling upon the nest, began depositing her eggs, thousands and thousands of them, so many that had they all hatched and grown, the river must have been full of salmon. That was a busy time for the old male with the hooked jaw. As the eggs were laid, he covered them hurriedly with gravel to keep the current from washing them away and to hide them from the little trout and pars that flashed about like sunbeams and that, spite of his fierce snaps and rushes, would dart in to grab a mouthful and scud away to eat it under the banks or the stones where he could not follow them. At times the little bandits seemed to hunt in packs like wolves, and while the big salmon was chasing one of their number, the others would flash in and gobble up all the uncovered tidbits. They would even steal under the mother salmon and snatch away the eggs as they were laid, till the old male came surging back and scattered them like a puff of smoke into their unseen dens. At last, however, the eggs were all laid, and covered up safely where even the pars could not find them, and in spite of all losses there were thousands enough left in every nest to warrant a full supply of young salmon. Then scores of the great fish, which had grown lank and dingy and faint from their five months' fast and their tremendous efforts in running up the river, rested a while, lying like logs all over the shallows, until the nights grew intensely still, and over the quiet pools the ice began to tinkle its winter warning. A subtle command ran along the river, which our salmon, like all other fish, seemed to obey without knowing why or how they did so. One morning they all turned in the current at the same moment, and went speeding back to the sea, leaving to the little brook the task of hatching their offspring. And the little brook, which was used to such things, at once took up the work, singing to itself the same glad little song that it had crooned for a thousand years over the hidden cradles of all the young salmon it had ever brooded. The winter passed slowly, a current of fresh water passed continually over the hidden treasures, and when the ice broke up in the spring, there was a general breaking up down among the eggs in the gravel nest. Something stirred vigorously within an egg, lodged between two white pebbles. The covering broke, and out glided Copseep, a tiny male salmon. In an instant, following his instinct, he had settled in the tiny eddy behind one of the pebbles, and from this shadowy hiding place he took his first look at the big world. All around him the tiny salmon were making their way out of the nest. As they emerged, the current seemed to sweep them away like mist, but in reality each one darted for the nearest stone or cover and vanished as if the bed of the river had opened to swallow him. Quick as they were, a score of them were seized by the hungry little trout and pars that swarmed in the shallows, each one hiding under a stone and watching like a hawk for food. But Copseep was safe under his root, whither he had darted from the shelter of his first pebble, and his struggle with the world had begun. 
For a year he had lived in the shallows as a little par, hiding from his enemies and eating of the insect life that swarmed in the water. Then, as he grew in strength and quickness, he took to chasing and catching the tiny eels that squirmed in the mud under the still reaches of the brook, and would flash up from the bottom and out into the sunshine to catch and pull down a passing fly. After every sortie, he would whirl and dart like a sunbeam under his root again. No need to look for envies, they were all about him, and he always took it for granted that they were waiting to catch him, and that his safety lay in getting back to the cover of his own den before they had noticed his movements. Occasionally, spite of his lightning dash, a little trout would spy him and dart between him and his sheltering root, and then Copseep would make use of a trick which every little salmon seems to know by instinct. He would dart away with a troutlet after him to where the bottom was softest and whirl up a muddy cloud into which his enemy dashed headlong. Then, before the troutlet could find him, Copseep was hidden under an inch of soft mud, or else, fearing the big eels, he would scoot back under a cover of the muddy screen to his own root whither no enemy ever followed him. As for the troutlet, he had speedily his own troubles to attend to. Besides the larger fish, which always chased at smaller ones that dared show themselves in open water, the mink was gliding in and out like a shadow. Kingfishers dropped in like plummets, getting a fish at almost every plunge, and the sheldrakes that had a nest just above were frightfully destructive, eating scores of trout in every day's fishing. So the troutlet, after one confused instant in the mud cloud, would forget our little Samlet, and flash away to his own den, thankful if he had himself escaped being seen and chased while he was chasing somebody else. In the midst of all these dangers, the par lived and throve mightily, and if one can judge from his play, for he had already begun to leap out of still water and tumble back with resounding splash in the quiet afternoons, he reveled in the strength and gladness of life, and the abundance of good things to be had for the chasing. In his first autumn, the big salmon appeared again in the shallows to spawn, and Copseep joined his fellows in scooting about and stealing the eggs whenever the big male with the hooked jaw was occupied in covering the furrows or chasing away the horde of active little robbers that swarmed about him. Copseep was now nearly six inches long, having increased a hundredfold in his weight in a few months. Catching a glimpse of him as he flung himself out of the waters in vigorous play, you would have seen a beautiful little creature his eyes bright as stars, his gleaming sides sprinkled with bright vermilion spots and crossed with the dark blue bars or finger marks which indicate the par state, and with exquisite pearly shells covering the deep red gills on either side. A trout you might have said as he rose like a flash to your fly, but another look would have told you plainly that he was more graceful and powerful and likewise much more beautiful than any trout that ever came out of the water. All winter long he lay by his den, seeking little food and growing strangely lazy. When spring came, a curious change crept over him. When he ventured into still water and looked in the wonderful mirror there, which was the undersurface of the pool and which you can see yourself by looking up obliquely into a glass of water, he saw that all the beautiful bars and spots of his fellows were slowly disappearing, being covered up by a new growth of silver scales. By the middle of May, the new scales had covered all his body. A curious uneasiness filled him as nature whispered that the new suit she had given him was for a new life, and at the word Copseep turned tail to the current and went speeding down the river where he had never been before. He was a smolt now, and all his brothers from the same nest were speeding down the river with him, leaving their sisters, still in their bright par coats, playing and feeding about the shallows where they were born. It was a wonderful journey for our little smolt, the more so because he had never before ventured away from the home brook, and he knew not why he went nor whither he was going on the long rushing migration. Down and down he hurried, now shooting easily through the dancing riffles, now whirling along the rush and tumble of a boiling rapid, and now caught up with irresistible force and hurled outward into a white chaos where all his universe seemed to be falling blindly into space that roared and trembled beneath him. But always his first instinct to keep close to bottom was with him, and even in the worst of rapids, a turn of his tail would send him down to where the water eddied and rolled leisurely among the stones, while the rush and uproar went on harmlessly overhead. And everywhere he went he had a sense of comradeship, of hosts that were moving onward with him to the same end. For the river was full of smotes, gliding, dodging, flashing like silver everywhere in the cool dark eddies, and all moving swiftly downward to the sea. So they passed from the hills to the low marshlands and lakes, 
and here they met shoals of great silver fish, their own mothers, beginning their long journey upward to the shallows, which the smolts had just left behind them. A new flavor came into the water as they followed the slow current. It was the taste of the sea, and a great thrill and tingle passed through the shoal of smolts, making them leap for joy and dash onward, down through the gentle surges of the tide, down faster and faster, till they scattered suddenly, and hid as another shoal of great salmon flashed into sight with a score of seals darting and twisting after them, like so many black demons. Over the hidden smolts passed the chase, like the rush of a tornado. Then the little fellows darted out of their hiding, and quivered onward, till they passed deep under the surge and thunder of the breakers, and vanished into the cool green forests of kelp and seaweed, that waved their soft arms everywhere on the ocean's floor, beckoning the frightened little wanderers to rest and safety. Here they waited a few days, and fed abundantly, and looked out with wonder from their green coverts, as from a window, at the strange new life that passed by them. Hermit crabs and starfish and sea robins and skates and stingrays and lobsters and dolphins and peter grunters, all with some outlandish peculiarity, or some queer, crazy way of flitting about, like dwarves or hobgoblins, so that every day Wonderland itself seemed to pass in procession before their windows. But the fever of migration was still upon them, and soon the shoal was moving onward more eagerly than before. New dangers met them with every mile. Strange and savage monsters, with goggle eyes and stickle backs and huge gaping mouths, surged out at them from coverts of rock and kale and sea moss. And from the bottom itself, where they looked like bits of innocent mud, flatfish and flounders leaped up into the very midst of the passing shoal. But their life in the quick waters of the brooks had made these little smolts like bundles of tempered steel springs, they were quicker far than the big savage bandits that looked so much more dangerous than they really were, and our own little smolt found no difficulty in dodging them and hiding under a frond of kelp till they had surged by. So the shoal passed on, still following the almost imperceptible flavour of their own river, till they were nearly twenty miles out at sea, and up from the bottom rose a ridge of rocky hills covered with waving sea growth. Here the fever suddenly left them, and the shoal scattered, each to his own little den, just as they had done in the shallows, far away in the green wilderness. A new and wonderful life had begun for Copsey, and the very best thing about it was the abundance of good things to eat. Millions of minute crustacea, tender and delicious, would swarm at times over his den, filling the water full of food and colouring it bright pink, like a tomato soup. He had only to swim lazily through it once or twice, with his mouth open, and come back gorged to his den as if he had been swimming around in a rich pudding. In an hour he was hungry, and would roll up through his strange food bath, filling himself again and again, till the swarm passed on with the tides. Then, led by his perpetual hunger, he passed over the rocky ridge to where the ocean's floor slanted upward, and spread out into broad level plains. Here the cod had laid their eggs in uncounted millions, and the codlings covered the place like flies on a butcher's block. The little gourmand would stuff himself till the tail stuck out of his mouth. Then, with a wriggle, he would spew them out and begin all over again, just for the delight of eating. Naturally, with all this good feeding, Copsey grew till his skin almost cracked to cover him. When he first came to the ocean, he was hardly as long as your hen, and would weigh perhaps three ounces. In a month he was a strong, shapely fish, a foot long and weighing over a pound, and his appetite, instead of diminishing, only grew more and more voracious as he increased in weight. No more crustacea or codlings for him now. He had himself joined the bandits that had at first frightened him, and was too big to be satisfied with such small fry. But when the shoals of brilliant Kaplan passed over him, making the sea look as if a rainbow had broken into bits and fallen there, his silver sides were seen flashing in and out among them. And then as he grew bigger and the Kaplan passed on shoreward with the tides, the herring came drifting in, like great silver clouds, with the seabirds screaming over them, and these were the best food of all. End of part one, end of section thirteen. Section fourteen of Northern Trails, book two. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Melissa Jean. Northern Trails, book two, by William J. Long. The Story of Copsey, Part 2 So three months passed in the ocean, and our little smolt had now become a grilsey, or gilsey, a beautiful fish of four pounds weight, with his silver sides spotted like a trout. 
only the spots were large and black instead of being small and red. As the summer waned, scores of small salmon began to move uneasily along the rocky ridges where the grilse were hiding. A fever seemed to spread through the water, and the salmon and grilse alike stopped their ravenous feeding. One morning the salmon moved off together, as if at command, and Copsy, with hundreds of his fellow grilse, followed them, the fever of motion growing stronger and stronger as they followed up the well-known flavour of their own river. Near the shore they stopped for a few days, waiting for the tides of a full moon, and old Daddy Crummet, who for weeks had not seen a salmon, set his nets again and found them each morning full to overflowing. Then when the tide was highest, the shoals surged into the river's mouth, past the rocky point where the seals were waiting and barking like hungry dogs at the smell of meat. With a rush our grilsey shot past the point where the water boiled and flashed as the shoal doubled away from their savage enemies. A lively young seal plunged after Copseep, but the grilsey was too quick and the seal turned aside after a large and lazier fish. So he gained the fresh water safely and journeyed swiftly upward through the lakes, jumping and playing in his strength till he came to the first swift run of water below the little falls. Here he put his nose down in an eddy behind a sunken rock and caught the current on his fins and tail in such a way as to hold himself in place without conscious effort, resting for his first leap and for the hard rush through the rapids above the falls. While he waited here, Copseep felt his stomach shrinking within him. There were fish in the river, minnows and trouts and eels, and lazy chub that the mink and fishhawk were catching. But Copseep watched them indifferently, and suffered them to go their own ways unmolested. Strangely enough, all his voracious appetite of the past few months had left him. And lucky it was, too, for otherwise a single run of salmon would destroy every trout and frog and little fish in the river. And that is perhaps why nature takes away the salmon's appetite, and keeps it for him all the while that he is going on a journey in fresh water. As he lay in his eddy resting, or playing with any bright-coloured thing that the current brought him, a troop of little silver smolts went hurrying and flashing by on their way to the sea. Though he knew it not, they were the little sisters that he had left as par in the shallows when he went away four months ago. No wonder Copseep did not recognise them, for they were hardly as big as the kaplan that he had been eating by scores for weeks past. He watched them curiously as they darted past, wondering where they came from and why they hurried so. Then he moved up under the falls and began to jump and poke his head out of the foam to study the place, as the salmon were doing before he took his leap. He tried it at last, flung himself headlong into the falls, and was promptly knocked end over end, and in a wink found himself bruised and quivering back by his own rock again. That seemed to teach him a wisdom, for at the next attempt he shot through a black eddy from which all the salmon took their leap, flung himself upward in a glorious arc struck fair in the swift water above the falls, and in an instant was flashing and plunging up through the rapids. Not till he reached a great pool two or three miles above did he halt, and then he settled down in another eddy to rest for his next effort. So he journeyed upwards for nearly two months, tarrying below the worst rapids for a fall of water, and wading in the rains wherever the river spread into broad shallows that hardly covered the salmon as they wriggled and splashed their way upward. Here one moonlit night, something like a black stump, stood squarely athwart Copsey's path. He was splashing his way toward it, when a sudden alarm made him halt behind a rock. A heedless fat salmon went lumbering by. The stump suddenly started into life. Then the fat salmon went flying out on shore, from the sweep of a paw, and Mooey and the bear went humping and jumping after him, to catch him before he could scramble back into the river. That was enough for our grill sea. Ever afterward, when he saw one, on moonlit nights, a black rock or stump in the shallows, he watched a while to see if it moved, before going through the dangerous place. And this is the test which all salmon and trout apply to every suspicious object. If it moves, it is dangerous, whether on land or water. That is why you catch only flashing glimpses of them as you walk along the bank. While on the other hand, if you sit very still on a rock, in the salmon pool, and trail your toe or finger or a single leaf in the current, you may see a big salmon move up to examine it leisurely, and sometimes he will spatter water all over you as he plunges at the object in play and whirls back to his eddy again. Late in October, Copsey found himself once more in the shallows at the mouth of the brook where he was born. He went straight to the root under which he used to hide, but the familiar place was grown so small that his head would not go into it, and the eddy there that used to hold him securely was now of no consequence whatever. 
So he took to cruising leisurely around the tiny world that had once seemed to him so big and full of danger. Danger? Why, this was a place of absolute peace compared with the dragon-haunted green forests under the sea. He was so big now that a thrill tingled all through Copsheap as he darted aside, making the shallow water roll and bubble, and whirled and doubled madly, and flashed in and out of the startled river with a long, black, snaky wake doubling after him, as if it was his own shadow that he was trying to escape. Like a flash he rose and leaped back, a clear eight feet over the shadow, which doubled softly and seized another grilsey that was ploughing furrows in a gravel nest. Out of the troubled waters slid first the head, then the long back and tail of an otter, which climbed the bank and stood mewing over her catch. Two more shadows glided into the river at her call, making our grilsey jump and flash away and hide again. But the newcomers were only two otter cubs that as yet had learned to catch only stupid chub and suckers. In a moment they were out on the bank, crouched with their long backs arched like frightened cats, nibbling daintily at the salmon, while Copsheep, forgetting all about them, roamed boldly over the shallows, looking for a little salmon to be his mate. He found her at last, preparing her nest just below the mouth of the brook, and began circling watchfully about her. Other grills see were numerous, and in searching for a mate, they would enter his circle aggressively, as if it were a chip that Copsheep were carrying on his shoulder. Like a flash he would rush at them, lock jaws and tug, and push and bully them out of the circle. Then when he returned, he had to bite and gouge and drive away the sea trout, huge fellows some of them, as big as himself, that swarmed hungrily about, waiting for the feast of salmon eggs. It was late autumn, the banks were strangely still and white, and ice had formed over all the still pools when Copsheap turned downstream again, leaving the eggs of his mate, safely covered in the new nest. He was like a kelt, or black salmon now, that is, a dark fish that had grown thin and hungry from tarrying and fasting too long in fresh water. Down he went, through the rapids and over the falls, in a desperate hurry that made him speed faster than the swift river, which had seemed so wonderful on his first journey in the springtime. In a single day's racing, he covered the entire distance, snapping up every little fish that crossed his swift path, and the next day found him back in his den in the rocky ridge under the ocean. This was the salmon's own foraging ground, and among the multitudes that swarmed there, Copsheap saw numerous fat young grilsey, almost as big as himself, but he knew not that these were the same little sisters he had met coming down, and that had changed rapidly from smolt to grilsey, while he was fighting his hard way up the river. The few rare fishermen who visit this part of the coast wonder why in this river, and indeed in many others, they catch only male grilsey, but the reason is probably a very simple one. The females pass the grilsey state in the ocean, growing steadily until the following spring, when males and females enter the river together as fully developed salmon of eight or ten pounds weight. All winter long our young grilsey, famished by his long fasting, gorged himself and grew fat and doubled his weight. When the May moon drew near her full, the migratory fever ran again along the rocky ridge under the ocean. For even down there, in the cold green underworld, Nature comes with the same message that sets the buds to swelling and the birds to singing. The largest salmon felt it first, and drifted away in a dense shoal, following up the delicate flavor of their own river, as a dog follows an air scent, or else remembering, as a mule does, every turn and winding of the trail that has once been followed. A month later, Copsy, with hundreds of his fellows, moved leisurely away after them. He was a salmon now, and had to take his chances with the seals that watched on the point of rocks and that neglected all other fish when the first run of salmon came plunging in through the breakers. He had passed them safely after a lively chase, and was playing and jumping hilariously in the pool at the head of the first lake, when a curious accident sent him hurrying back to the sea. And that was only the beginning of a long chain of causes which made him bigger than all his fellows. On the lake were a pair of loons that had a nest on a bog hard by, and that were always fishing. Huckweem was deep under water, chasing a big trout one day, which darted in a copseep's pool and vanished under a root. As Huckweem sped noiselessly by, trailing a great string of silver bubbles, the waving of a great tail caught his eye just beyond the root, and like a flash he plunged at it, diving his pointed bill deep into copseep's side. Had it been a big trout, the blow would have stunned him on the spot. But at the first touch, the salmon tore himself free and leaped clear of the water. 
Her queen passed on, seeing his mistake, and the next moment Copsip was back in the pool, fanning the water quietly as if nothing whatever had happened. Since entering fresh water, Copsip's appetite had vanished, but now it began suddenly to gnaw again. This was simply nature's way of telling him to go back to the sea where he might be healed. It was not the pain of his wound, for like other fish he seemed to feel nothing of that kind. Had he stayed in the fresh water, the parasites would speedily have fasted on the raw flesh and killed him, but of that he knew nothing. He simply felt hungry, and remembered that in the sea there was food in abundance. Salmon fishermen have always noticed how wounded fish suddenly begin feeding. Sometimes when the wound is no more than the mark of a net, which has split a fin or brushed off a ring of scales around the head, the marked salmon will plunge at a fly more vigorously than any of his fellows in the pool, and will even take worms or a shiner if your sportsmen allow you to offer them. So Copsheep, feeding only the hunger, which was nature's simple direction without her explanations, turned swiftly back to sea, and almost within the hour was resting in his old den under the rocks again. He stayed all summer long, while other salmon moved off in successive shoals and battled their way up the river. Copsheep, whose migratory fever seemed to be cured by the thrust of a loon's bill, gave himself up to the unlimited abundance of the ocean and discovered for himself, one day, a new and delicious food supply. It was late in the summer after the Kaplan had passed by, and Copsheep, after his wont, was gliding in and out of the green forest arches, and poking his hungry nose into every den among the rocks. In a little arched doorway, with some waving green weeds for a curtain, his nose touched something soft, which instantly shrank back, closer to the sheltering rock. Copsheep pulled it out promptly and found a small lobster, which was hiding there, waiting for its new shell to grow. A delicious taste, the most wonderful he had ever experienced, filled his mouth as he bolted the morsel. All excitement after the manner of feeding fish, Copsy put his nose into another den and found another lobster, a bigger one, that offered no resistance as he was dragged out and eaten. It was also different from previous experience that the salmon knew not what to make of it. He had often passed lobsters before, crawling slowly along the bottom on the tiptoes of their queer legs, or shooting backward like winks and hiding in the mud when frightened by a huge and hungry sea bass. Their shells were too hard for Copsheep to think of cracking, and besides, each lobster carried two pairs of big ugly jaws in front of him as he yee-yawed along. These jaws were always wide open, one pair armed with little teeth for catching and holding things, and the other with big teeth for crushing whatever was caught. So Copsheep had wisely let the lobsters alone, and had no idea that they were good to eat. Now, however, the hard shells had all split along the backs, and the lobsters left the shoal water and the fishermen's lobster pots to seek out deep hidden caves among the rocks. There they crawled out of the old shells and lay very quiet and hiding, waiting for the new shells to grow hard enough to make it safe for them to venture out into the world once more. End of Part 2 End of section 14. Section 15 of Northern Trails, Book 2. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Melissa Jean. Northern Trails, Book 2. By William J. Long. The Story of Copsheep, Part 3. It was at this time, when the lobsters were most defenseless, that Copsheep found them. There were hundreds of them from the size of your hand up to the big shy fellow that would fill a basket, each one hidden away in his own den. And Copsheep left all other game and took to lobster hunting. It was a tingling kind of sport, gliding noiselessly with every sense on the alert, through the waving forests and over the rocks, for scores of hungry bandits, monstrous sea bass and horse mackerel, and worst of all dogfish, had taken advantage of the new food supply, and were lurking in every covert, ready to snap up the salmon and other fish that came hunting for lobsters. So Copsheep never knew, when he approached a den, whether he would find a tidbit for himself or an ogre to eat him up. And his hunting was very much as if you were prowling among the woods and mountain caves, expecting game at every moment, but not knowing whether you would find a rabbit that you wanted, or a big grizzly bear, or a dragon that might want you. His method of hunting never varied. He would glide among the waving green fronds, trying, as every other wild creature does, to see everything without himself being seen, until he spied a little cave or den that might hide a soft-shelled lobster. Then he would settle down where the sea growth hid him, 
and watch all the surroundings steadily. If nothing stirred, and if no suspicious glint of bronze or silver scales flickered in the waving forest, he would glide up and peer into the den. If the lobster were there, and not too big, he dragged him out and ate him quickly. But at the first suspicious glint or movement, he would whirl like a flash, making the delicate seaweeds roll and quiver violently to hide his flight. And the next instant he was fifty feet away, and hidden so cunningly that the big shark or sea bass would drive straight over his head without seeing him. Once as he hunted in this way, he spied a queer cave on the rocks, with gleaming white points reaching up from the bottom and down from the top, like stalactites and stalagmites, and with just room enough for him to swim in between them. A perfect place it looked for the nice soft lobster to be hiding. Copsy lay in the weeds and watched a few moments, then glided forward to enter. Just then something began to glow dull red over the cave, and in a flash Copsy had whirled away, while the long weeds swayed and rolled and hid him as he darted aside. In a moment he was stealing back to watch the den from another hiding place. Suddenly the whole cave seemed to move and tremble. The white points above and below came slowly together, and there was no more an open doorway. Out from the rocks glided a queer monster of a mouthfish, coloured like the grey rocks, with dull red eyes and a head like a Chinese dragon. He looked around for a moment, backed into his lair, opened his huge mouth, and there was the cave again, looking just like a den in the rocks. But Copsy was not looking for any more lobsters in that neighbourhood, and he was a wiser and more wary fish as he glided away on his solitary hunting. So the long summer passed by and Copsy grew daily larger with his comfortable and lazy living. When his brothers and sisters came down from the river, they found him more than twice their size, and a full twenty pounds in weight. By spring he had added five pounds more, and when the first shoal of big salmon moved riverward, with the tides of full moon, Copsy was among them. For on this run, when the river is full and strong with the spring floods, only the largest fish are equal to the hard work of climbing the falls and rapids. So the years went by with little change in Copsy's methods of living. Only he grew bigger and bigger, and his long summer in the sea had made him even more full of moods and whims than most salmon. Once when a flood had blocked the river with logs, so that the salmon could neither swim under nor jump over the obstacle, he had gone down the coast with a few of his fellows and run up a new stream, contrary to the habits of all salmon, which in general run up only the rivers in which they are born. Another season when he was heavier and lazier than usual, he had ascended the river only as far as the first rapids, just above the tide water. There, with a dozen unusually large fish, he spent a month playing idly and sleeping, as salmon often do. And when you hooked one of these big fellows, he bolted headlong down the river, and either smashed your tackle, or, if you were quick enough to leap into your canoe, for they never stopped or skulked like other salmon, he took you swiftly out through the breakers, and you had the rare experience of playing a salmon in the open sea. This year, Copsy has come up leisurely as far as the pool below the falls, and this is as far as he will ever get, if our tackle holds and he still keeps on rising at pretty things that the current sweeps over him. See, there he is, a monster salmon, plunging out of the white rips, just where we left him when we sat down by the river to hear his story. We have rested him long enough now, and have changed the number six, Jock Scott, to a number eight of the same kind, and all the while Copsy is rising splendidly. A suitable excitement creeps over you as the long line shoots out from the springing tip, farther and farther, till it falls straight across the white turmoil below which the salmon is lying. Swiftly the leader swings down and straightens in the current. The tiny fly whirls up and dances for an instant in the very spot where you saw Copsy rise. There, a swift rush and the flash of heavy shoulders as he turns downward. Don't strike now, as you would a trout, for the spring of your tip against the heavy plunge of that big fish will snap your leader as if it was made of cobweb. A ponderous surge at the end of your rod, a light pull to set the hook fast, then your heart jumps to your mouth, and all your nerves thrill and tingle, and shout hilariously as your reel screams at the first terrific rush. Out of the river springs a huge salmon, shooting up like a great jack-in-the-box, and tumbles in and jumps out again, here, there, everywhere at once, like a rooster with his head cut off. Away he goes, zzzm, leaping clearer and throwing himself broadside across ten feet of white water, shaking his head like a dog with a woodchuck. 
and then a headlong rush and tumble down the first rapids with the real screaming shrill defiance after him at every plunge noel has started to his feet at the first rush and reaches instinctively for the long gaff Pycosh, oh Pycosh, big one he says staring open-mouthed at the torrent not knowing where copsey will come up next then he settles back and fills his pipe knowing well that a half hour of delicate skilful work must follow before you will get any glimpse of the big fish other than what he chooses to give you by leaping clear of the water trying to strike the line with his tail or to shake himself free of the tormenting little thing that plucks him by the jaw and that holds on in spite of all his shaking and jumping he is down in the pool below now resting for an instant in the eddy under a big rock three-fourths of your line is already out of the reel and if he makes another rush downstream you must lose him down you go lively scrambling over the rocks floundering through the water slipping sliding stumbling down you go all the while with your rod up and bent to keep a strain on the fish and with the reel singing its rhythmic zoom 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 as you hurriedly gather in the line get below your salmon now and stay below him if you possibly can for then he will have to fight against the current as well as against the spring of your rod as you carry out the cunning maneuver copseep starts off on another series of wild leaps and rushes swings wide across the river and again darts below you he lies quiet in one deep spot where the pull of your rod will just balance the push of the current the line stands straight up humming steadily while a spurt of white water curls up beside it all the while you feel a steady succession of harsh tugs and jerks that threaten every instant to part your tackle copseep is jigging and that means he is hooked and probably lightly in the lip rather than in the mouth or tongue and that you must be extra careful if you expect to get him could you see him now you would find that he is standing fair on his head in the current darting his jaw with rapid jerks against the bottom trying to scrape off your fly or to break your leader against the stones ten minutes pass slowly and though you are below him pulling his head sideways as hard as you dare you have not budged him an inch then noel appears gliding in and out like a shadow among the trees on the bank some stones noel big ones you call to him and the indian begins to hurl stones at the spot where copseep is sulking a lucky one starts him at last and he is off like a flash rushing and jumping all over the pool while you endeavor desperately to reel in the bagging line and keeps copseep out of the strong rush of water against the farther bank spite of you he surges into it then feeling the full power of the flood he starts straight down like an express train for the distant sea after him you go splashing like a startled moose through the pools jumping the rocks like a goat down down through the rapids with a heavy side pull for you are getting desperate at every turn of the river till with a single immense satisfaction you lead him out of the current into a still deep reach of the river and here the fight begins all over again up to the present moment every chance in the unequal struggle was in the salmon's favor but now you venture a wee small hope that you may get him down below are some heavy rapids where you can neither follow nor hold your fish so for half an hour you coax and humor and bully him letting him have his own way when he is heading where you want him to go but straining your light tackle to the breaking point to turn him away from the rapids then a great silver side rolls up heavily for an instant showing that he is weary enough to be led and you begin cautiously to reel him into the bank noel has disappeared thinking of course that you lost your fish in the second desperate run through the rapids you are half glad for now you have a chance to land a salmon in the most sportsman-like way of all by beaching him yourself without help from the big gaff there's only one possible spot hereabouts for so delicate a landing a little shingly beach where the bank shelves gently lead into the river if you can lead him there on his side at the first touch of the bottom he will flap his tail and kick himself out on land aided by the gentle pull of your line just below the spot a broken stub leans far out only two or three feet above the water that is a danger point but you must either risk it or shout for noel and you are glad thinking of copseep to give him the one small chance now you avoid the beginner's eagerness and the mistake of being in too much of a hurry and play your salmon till he rolls up on his side and lies there fanning the water then gently very gently you lead him toward the shingle he is almost yours you could gaff him yourself as he swings past you but your nerves tingle as you see how big he is 
but at the first touch of the stones a new strength quivers suddenly in Copseep. He turns on his belly, surges heavily downstream, and spite of the straining rod, passes slowly, powerfully, under the leaning stub. You drop your rod instantly to the horizontal, so that your leader will not touch the wood, and draw him out towards the middle of the river. Again he rolls up on his side exhausted, and lies for a moment just below the stub. His eyes see it dimly, and with a last mighty effort, he turns and leaps clear over it upstream. The line doubles around the log. He falls with all his weight on the taut leader. There is a heavy splash. Then the salmon is lying free in the shallows. The fly swings loose under the leaning stub, with a tiny white bit of Copseep's lip glistening on the barb. On the instant you have dropped your rod, and all the sportsman calm vanishes in the fisherman's eagerness as you jump forward to grab him. Your hands grip his broad back, but his slippery sides seem to ooze out between your fingers as he rolls away. A swift plunge as he sees his big enemy, then a broad tail waves triumphantly over the flood and the salmon vanishes into the deeps. Goodbye, Copseep, and good luck. You're the biggest fish I have seen all summer, and of course you got away. Up at Copswagen, the salmon are still rising, but I have no more heart for the little nine-pounders. Till next summer, then, when I shall look for you again in the same place under the falls. Meanwhile, may the bear and the seal and the shark and the net always miss you. The fisherman has no regrets that your story is not yet ended. End of the story of Cop Seep. End of section 15. End of Northern Trails Book 2 by William J. Long.